Welcome back from that incredible networking session. I hope you had fun, made some new friends, new connections, learned what's going on in Brooklyn, New York City. Um, it was great to see everybody engaging with each other. I love that. Um, we're switching up our afternoon session just a little bit. The order is going to be a little bit different than what we had originally planned. Um, so for that reason, we're going to start our afternoon session with our long-term collaborator and the director at large of our Committee on Plant-Based Health and Nutrition here at Downstate, who also happens to work at the New York City Mayor's Office, um, Rachel Atchison. Rachel is a unique force in support of plant-based nutrition and sustainability in New York City. She currently serves as the Deputy Director of New York City Mayor's Office of food, um, food Policy. And, um, she previously served as Borough President Adams Deputy Strategist uh, focusing on plant forward food policy in the city by contributing to the establishment of Meatless Mondays in the New York City schools um, and the launch, yeah, yep, and the launch of the lifestyle medicine programs in H&H &H hospitals um, and other public health and sustainability initiatives around plant-based nutrition, and she's here today to give us an update on all the great work that she's doing with the mayor's office. So warm welcome to Rachel Atchison. Thank you all so much. I feel like we know each other now that we've been through the networking session where I think I sit down with every single one of you. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. My name is Rachel Atchison. I serve under this mayor, mayor, mayor Eric Adams. I think most everyone in here knows his health journey, but for those who don't, he actually went into remission with his type 2 diabetes uh, about seven, eight years ago now. Um, and that's why we're here. You know, my office, the mayor's office of food policy, it was previously an office of two and now we're an office of 10 and that's because he has really put his money where his mouth is in terms of food policy really advancing this across the board um, and I have taken about a hundred and fifty slide deck and I've made it into a 20 slide deck which means that I'm going to take out a ton of content so there's a lot of things listed here that I'm not going to be going into today because I really just want to give you how, an overview of how the city is navigating moving in a more plant forward direction. So with our procurement process, just to let you all know, New York City has about $300 million that we spend on food across the system. That's in our schools, our hospitals, our jails, our homeless shelters, and our older older adult centers. So we spend a lot of money on food, which means that we can actually change some of the purchasing habits that we've had previously to be in a more plan for a direction. And I'm going to jump to where we serve uh, the most meals, which is schools. So we serve about a million kids a day um, in our school meal process. Uh, and that means we have a, a lot of opportunity um, for good, but we also have to build on what we've already done. So we already implemented universal school lunch. We already implemented meatless Mondays. So when we got into office, we started plant powered Fridays. Um, and that is an initiative that the Office of Food Nutrition Services implements alongside wonderful partners such as wellness in the schools, such as Plant Powered Metro New York, such as Coalition for Healthy School Food. There's so many wonderful players in this space. Um, and one of them, Wellness in the Schools, is actually bringing culinary education, culinary training into each school system, uh, into each school, uh, and really training the chefs that are in um, those schools. We've came up, because of a, a chef's council, we actually implemented uh, 100 new recipes that we are rotating through the cycle to get students exposed to more plant-based options throughout their career. But it's not just what is served in schools, it is also what is taught in schools. So the curriculum has to sort of match that sort of approach that we have. So we implemented a food education roadmap last June, and we are in the journey of implementing this uh, in the Department of Education, really building onto what does the curriculum look like? By ninth grade, are we learning about marketing? Are we marketing? Are we learning about by 10th grade, are we learning about lifestyle medicine? By 11th grade, are we learning about animal agriculture and the environment? There's just so much that we can do in this space and we're just scratching the surface. And we're scratching the surface thanks to partners like these who are really going into New York City public schools uh, and educating the students, educating the families, um, et cetera. So our chronic disease prevention work, 
Obviously, at our core is our lifestyle medicine work with uh, H&H, &H, um, but more so because our health and hospitals only represents about 25% of all hospitals in New York City, we have to think, how do we get nutrition education into those arenas uh, of, the, of the majority, that three quarters percent, that 75% of hospitals that don't have a Dr. Michelle McMacken at their helm. How do we move that needle? So Nate Trafinsky on the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services team, he's been able with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine to move this needle and get nutrition education, uh, a five-hour training to every New York City public hospital, every New York City public and private hospital. So if you're at an institution who you might not have heard about this, definitely get in touch with me because it is available for every single New York City uh, um, person in the medical system. So that is through our health and hospitals department. Now through our department of health, we have what's called the food standards. For those who are not in the minutia of government bureaucracy, these are actually the standards that every agency that serves food has to adhere by. So the really amazing thing about the new iteration of the food standards that were released last year is that we now require a plant-based protein to be served once a week for lunch, once a week for dinner, in all city-run contracts. So that's in your, uh, that's in your hospitals, which um, we'll get to in a minute. Um, that's in your homeless shelters, that's in your jails, um, that's in your schools as well. So um, our food standards are one of those bureaucratic mechanisms that are actually really exciting. Um, and our Department of Health has been a wonderful partner at sort of getting out news that we need to eat a whole lot more plants. So we have some nutrition security programs that we have built on the shoulders of um, that uh, Department of Health runs as well. To wrap up, I will mention that you know, there's a lot of problems with our food system outside of the healthcare space. So obviously today we are laser focused on health, but there is a, an environmental footprint that comes mostly from our beef, lamb, and dairy. Um, and what we have done is pledge to reduce our carbon emissions by 33% by 2030. How are we doing this? Well, thanks to Chef Phil and Samantha, who are here from Sodexo, um, we are actually implementing plant-based defaults in all New York City public hospitals, so those 11 hospitals. And you're ser we're serving things like this. We're serving delicious meals that we've taste tested, and turns out people love, and about 50% of people stick with that option. 50% opt for the meat-based option, but the people who are choosing that plant-based option are actually saving us 59 cents per meal. So we're engaging the private sector. We've asked them to sign up for the Plant Powered Carbon Challenge. Uh, and if anyone here knows institutions who might want to join that challenge, get in touch. I would love to, to make that connection. And the newest part of looking at our carbon emissions is saying, can we bring a plant-based culinary center to Rikers Island to implement a, a culinary training? And so we're doing that this September, October. So that is the sort of latest and greatest in New York City food policy. Um, I think I gave, I gave out all of my cards today, so I do not have any more, but several people here know how to get in touch with me. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, email, more than happy to talk um, because we have, uh, we have just started to scratch the surface of what New York City has the possibility and, and capability of doing. Um, but I think it really depends on each one of us as an individual moving that bottle forward. Um, and so thank you for your time and, and being here today. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to the rest. Thanks, Beth. Now we are going to hear from, from some experts who truly take the whole person approach to diabetes care. Um, we're going to be talking to professionals in health coaching, nutrition, and physical activity about more ways to help people with diabetes make meaningful life lifestyle change. This panel is going to be hosted by our own faculty here in physical therapy, Dr. Joanne Katz. Dr. Katz's research interests include neurodevelopmental issues in infants and the pathomechanics of gait, and her clinical specialties include the assessment of motor control problems in infants and young children, and treatment of children with cerebral palsy. Um, Dr. Katz herself adopted a whole food plant-based diet to help protect herself against heart disease, which is prevalent in her family. And she spreads the news about the power of plant-based nutrition in lectures and presentations to students and faculty at Downstate. Joanne is going to be joined today by dietitian Yandra Doring, 
health coach Chrisanne Polito Muller, diabetes educator and nurse practitioner Lucille Hughes, and Dr. Melissa Lee, who directs the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic at Kings County Hospital across the street. So I would like to invite everybody to come on up here, and we can get some more some more uh, advice. This session is a little different than the session that we had this morning. Um, each one of our panelists, who are experts in their own areas, um, I'm going to let each one of them introduce themselves to you. Then I'm going to ask each of our um, uh, panelists a question, and they can ex expand on it for, you know, uh, for quite some time, each one of them. And when we get done, we may do more questions, or if we're getting towards the end, then we're going to open it up to audience questions. And this time, we only have one microphone on that side. So if anybody's over here, you'll just need to walk around uh, to get to that microphone, just to let you know. Okay, so my panelists, if each one of you uh, could, if you were introduced by Beth, but just to give a little bit more background of uh, where you're from and what type of work that you do. Hi everyone, my name is Yandra Doring. I'm a registered dietitian, plant-based re plant registered dietitian. I work at Kings County with the Lifestyle Medicine Program. So I have been working for 10 years in the community nutrition uh, area here in New York City. I have consulted for the Department of Health, worked for nonprofits, and now I'm super happy to be part of this amazing expansion of bringing more health and wellness through like the six pillars of health. So thank you for having me today. Hi, I'm Chrisanne Polito Muller. I'm the director of health coaching services for New York City Health and Hospitals. I work with Dr. McMacken in central office. I'm also the health coach at Bellevue Hospital and started the program with Dr. McMacken in 2019. Um, Yantra is my colleague. And, and so is Felissa. And um, we're building such an amazing team. We're really excited on the future of our program. I'm also a certified um, personal trainer, certified uh, group exercise instructor, a yoga therapist, and a bunch of other things. So um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really hoping that we can bring lots of um, everyday tips uh, for everybody to use. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Lee. I'm trained as an internist pediatrician, and I'm a primary care doctor at Kings County and also oversee the lifestyle medicine program. My other hat is as program director for the primary care internal medicine residency program. So I have lots of very eager learners who love to learn about different ways they can take care of patients other than prescriptions. Um, so thanks, Beth, for inviting me to be part of this today. Um, I guess my uh, fact is that I also am a chronic marathoner. Uh, and so I, I will talk about exercise today, mostly you know, from my own experience and, and that of some of our patients um, and from our, our staff. Wonderful. Good afternoon. I was going to say good morning. Um, I am Lucille Hughes. I am the Assistant Vice President for Diabetes Education and Program Design for Catholic Health. In November 2022, uh, we had launched our Center for Functional Medicine and Optimal Health, and I'm so thrilled that I've been involved since day one in launching that program. I am a nurse by profession, but certified in diabetes education for 35 years. So I'm thrilled to be here today and to share our experiences with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, panelists. So we're gonna start, we'll start on this side and just work our way down with everybody and, and ask you the questions. Uh, so we'll start first with Yandra. Um, if you could address the role of exercise as part, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> wrong question. Can you address uh, the culturally based aspect of dealing with plant-based nutrition and diabetes? Yeah, so well, for, for us in our lifestyle medicine program, that's something that is very important to be able to provide uh, care that is very comprehensive and addresses like all the cultural uh, thing, uh, the cultural 
aspects that we see here in New York City. We're a very diverse, uh, we live in a very diverse environment, right? So everywhere you go, you're going to see people from all over the world. So in our program, something that we have been doing for Life of Medicine is taking this into consideration, not only in the nutrition aspect, but with the six pillars of health. So regarding nutrition, something that it's very important for us is to um, be very aware of the culturally dietary patterns of our patients and also the cultural perceptions of food, right? So when a patient comes to, to me or any of the dietitians of the Lifestyle Medicine Program, so the first thing that we do is we ask a lot of questions, right? Curiosity is the best tool that you can use as a practitioner, right? So this is something that Dr. McMacken was mentioning, like you get to know your patients, get to know your, your community, right? Because sometimes you can give the best recommendations for them, especially with our patients living with diabetes, but they will tell you straight to your face, that's not my food, you know? So you really need to understand. And if you don't know and you're not familiar, get familiar, get a book, talk to them. Ask them questions like, what are your favorite foods? Okay, so how can we modify this in a way that makes sense that you are going to be able to integrate more plant-based uh, elements into your plate, right? So the other thing is to tailor every time that you see a patient in an individual way. Like I can have two patients from the same cultural background, but they might have different tastes, right? So they might not like the same food. So I have to take that into consideration when I am counseling this, my patients. Uh, another thing that you can do is every single culture at least has two or three different plant-based dishes. So we can start from there, right? As doc uh, some of our doctors that were speaking earlier, we can start maybe with breakfast, right? So a little modification there, right? So just giving a little adjustment. We don't want them to change their diet from like entirely. So we want to take them in a very steady and very s slow change so they can create something that is more sustainable for them. So other things that we, we can take into consideration is provide the appropriate resources, right? Be prepared with recipes, be prepared with like materials that they're culturally appropriate, appropriate for them, right? So, and also help them to address any barriers that they might be out there. Right? So a lot of times, like these little changes might be easy for me or for some of you, but for patients, this might be like changes that they are like, you know what, I don't know how I feel about changing this about my diet, so how can we negotiate, right? So, and also introducing them to any kind of resources that you think that might be something that they might be willing to experiment, like maybe a new ingredient, right? So what about, about instead of like using, I don't know, like ground beef, we can use maybe some tempeh or things like that, right? So it might be a challenge for some of them, or some of them might be like, oh, I have never heard of that before. So the way that, that we approach this is, uh, at, at least in our program, is just very slowly, right? So we're not going to go for the tempeh at the first time that we meet the patient. <laughs> so, but we might be just starting with some recommendations and maybe after like our third visit, they're like, you know what? I know that you mentioned that weird food that I have never heard about. Right? <laughs> so can yeah. you give me a recipe? Like you say something about tempeh bacon. So I'm, I'm more like, okay, so I, I was a success with all these other recipes. So I'm prepared to start making these changes. So I think that by addressing like this, uh, like this things that can be challenges, it can be something that, or it might be easy for our patients. So, but also by addressing this, so we are going to be able to give more cultural competent uh, care to them. So, which is what we want to do. Thank you. Yandra, yeah. do you want to um, tell everybody how uh, the, the group helps and, and um, culturally in the Spanish group that we have? Oh yeah, so th this has been uh, something that we are launching uh, so in collaboration with the Bellevue team. So, but like uh, the Bellevue team has developed like this amazing curriculum that is 14 weeks that they take, what we take the patients through like the six pillars of health. And we have discovered that depending on like your cultural background, right? So patients might be more chatty. They might be more willing to like say more things. Some patients might be like a little bit more quiet because that's part of the culture, right? So sometimes people just need to express and tell you, hey, I know this, you know? So let me tell people, let me be proud of my cultural background. So it's, it's something that it has been very enriching a lot, our program. 
Yeah, I find uh, when I'm looking for specific recipes that are from different uh, cultural backgrounds, there's a lot of good, uh, you know, uh, plant-based cookbooks out there like Robin Robertson. She has recipes from all different cultures or like uh, I'm Italian, so I go to uh, buy Chloe. Uh, and I just modify that because there's a little too much oil in it. But, but still, you know, you can find them cookbooks that will have uh, the plant-based recipes that are, that seem familiar to them. And, and like you said, use the, the tempeh instead of yeah, Chop meat. yeah, sometimes it's just about telling them, like, what about adding your spices to this plant-based protein, you know, or to this vegetable? And they will be like, oh, I never thought about that, you know, so, but they're, usually our patients are very willing to experiment, mm -hmm. so, yes. because so, something that I, I want to remind you, at least at health and hospitals, we accept everyone, right? So we work with everyone. So our program is not like an elite kind of program. We take people who may be never able to afford to come to a program like that, right? Mm -hmm. So, and something that it has been very like gratifying, at least for our team at King's and probably at Bellevue, is that the patients really, really appreciate that we take the time and we're teaching them all these skills. So, and they are like, you know what? Like, I really want to embrace this. I know that this, Maybe in another time of my life, I would not have done this. Mm -hmm. But something that I, I love that when, when I work with my patients, with our patients, and uh, our health coach can, can corroborate this. So sometimes we ask them, like, what kind of advice would you give to your younger self, you know, mm -hmm. right now? You know? And they were like, you know, I will eat more vegetables, definitely. I will sleep more. I will be better connection. I will have better connections, you know? So it's, it's something that it's, it's just really wonderful how can lifestyle medicine really, really help people from diverse backgrounds? Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna move on to one of the other pill, another pillar uh, of lifestyle medicine uh, with uh, Chris Ann. Uh, if you could address uh, sleep hygiene for individuals with diabetes and provide strategies for patients to change their lifestyle behaviors. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Yandra, too. Um, you know, sleep is one of those pillars that we take, um, we don't really take seriously, right? Um, culturally, we're like, work more. I can hustle, I can get more done if I don't sleep. Um, I really, I'm really productive at 1 a.m. in the morning, or right? We, we hear this a lot. And when we start to really break down a patient's why, why is it important for you to be in this program? What has brought you here? What matters to you? And it goes beyond lab numbers a lot of times. It's, I want to spend more time with my grandchildren. I want to be able to walk to the park with my family. I want to go to the social celebrations that I can't get to because I physically can't walk through that door. I can't it's not accessible for me. So when we really connect to why they're here, we start to put those little actions that Yandra was talking about, and we connect it to that why and to whatever disease they're looking at. So for instance, diabetes, sleep is so crucially important to diabetes, but it's really crucially important for behavior change. If you're not sleeping, you're not getting up early to take that morning walk, right? <laughs> or we're not grabbing the meal prep that we really didn't have time to do the night before because I got to bed late and now I'm late for work and I don't have time, right? Once we start to get some sleep going for our patients, all of a sudden they have a little more energy, right? They feel better. They're like, oh, this, this must be working. Oh, you know what? I, I think I can stop watching TV a little before I go to bed and make that breakfast, right? So really connecting it with why they're there and what's important to them. Sometimes putting like pictures of their family members that they want to do things with on their, their closet door, their bathroom mirror, or their refrigerator to really keep those little actions really relative to them. And I like to explain sleep to a lot of patients like landing a plane, right? During the day, we have this really busy day, the planes, 
uh, flying around 30,000 feet, right? When we're ready to land that plan, we don't just drop it, right, <laughs> and land, right? We slowly start to descend. And we talk about that a lot. How, what, what's going on for you from when you get home to bedtime? Are you creating a calm atmosphere? Are you living in a calm atmosphere? Maybe you're not. How can you start to land your plane? What does that mean to you? What brings joy to your life? What brings comfort to you? And we start to look at, we're already reducing our stress then. We're reducing our, um, our daytime fatigue. We're st like Dr. McMacken said before, we're asking them about liquids. Are you, are you stopping liquids and food about two hours before you go to bed? And people are sleeping through the night and feel fantastic, right? Are you sleeping consistently? What's happening? Are you waking up at three, three o'clock in the morning and trying to figure out all that stuff that went on yesterday or is gonna happen the next day? Can we use some tools like expressive writing? Expressive writing is when for 20 minutes um, a day or twice a day, usually in the morning at night, you just kind of brain dump. You just start writing what's on your mind and instead of your brain trying to hold it here so you don't forget, right, it's on that paper. I know it's on that paper. I can kind of let it go for a little while. We usually ask them to rip it up. It's not there to kind of analyze, it's to just kind of let it go, right? Let it go and continually do that. Even if you're writing the same thing, it really gives your brain that, that uh, time to wind down, your nervous system to wind down. We also talk about exercise. When are you exercising? If you're exercising really close to bedtime, is that causing you to, for your body to go, hey, I've got some energy now, Let, let's stay up, let's, this is really fun. What are we going to do today, right? Let's extend this day. Or how about if you're watching something that's really exciting on TV, or you're watching a really, you're reading a really good book, all of a sudden four or five hours ha have passed, and it's two o'clock in the morning, and you intended to go to sleep. So these are all little things that we do on an, on an everyday basis that we really don't look at in the context of our why. So we really help patients really connect that and look at which ones they feel is achievable. What's one of those that you feel would really move the needle for you? Because our patients are the expert. They know their life. They know what's going on day to day. They know their everyday stresses. They know how they feel. And they will, tell, they will give you the answers. They will show you where they want you to lead them, right? So it's super important. I think all of my colleagues would say really listening to our patients and helping them and supporting them on that walk. So if it's sleep health, right? If it's recognizing their daily habits on how that affects their sleep and how that affects their diabetes, on how they, they're eating, how that affects, are you eating really close to bedtime? That's a really, that's a really big confounding factor. Now I have energy, right? Or I've had a lot of water, because I haven't really had a lot of water all day, so I'm gonna drink it now. Well, then I'm up five times <laughs> during the night, right? That's happened to all of us at one point or another, and how that affects how they feel. We, we saw when we were looking at the guidelines on sleep, how waking up so many times affect us, right? We, we saw how it changes our mood. Sleep is really one of those like, like sit, those nets of all those pillars that holds up all the other pillars. It's really amazing how just these little tweaks can really start to give patients self-efficacy. They think, wow. I, I think I can do this, right? We, we give them those little, little windows that they can really feel self, they have a lot of self-efficacy, meaning they have confidence that what I'm doing is really going to help me, that I'm trusting you to give me in the, the information that I'm not gonna be too overwhelmed, but I can actually move the, 
the needle on my disease. So sleep is, is super important, super important for diabetes management. I have a follow-up question yeah. on that. Um, what do you, how do you counsel parents of very young children? Mm. Because, you know, it's so hard sometimes to get them to go to sleep at night, and you know, you gotta rock them to sleep, and then maybe they wake up during the night. And you know, these, I'm talking about working parents. Oh, yeah. So, so oh, you know, yeah. they're doing, and working parents of young, young children. Oh, definitely. Um, really, we, we have to ask them, you know, what is your reality? Mm -hmm. What is your day like? Take me, when you wake up, what happens? And really look at, where they think they can get some time. They may say, you know what, I don't think I can get any more sleep, but at lunchtime, I think I have 20 minutes where maybe I could do a meditation. Or I really think I need some time with my friends to let some steam off, so when I go to bed, I can go to sleep. Like, people, we have to trust our patients, because mm -hmm. yeah. they do know, they do know. They just need that person to stand next to them and help guide them and um, really steer them in the direction that they're going in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, because as I was listening to you, I was thinking about my kids with their very small children, yeah. and that's true for all of us who have small kids or you know anybody with young children, it's like they're perpetually, the parents are perpetually oh, sleep are. deprived. <laughs> yes, they yeah. are. Okay, so uh, now we move on to Dr. Lee. And this morning we heard uh, a good deal about the, the role of exercise as uh, part of the whole person approach uh, to living. Uh, but Dr. Lee, if you can give us some, you know, additional information talking about, you know, what you would say to patients in your practice and, and you know, how you would uh, consult with those, you know, health, uh, the uh, health coaches or PTs or exercise specialists that uh, you might work with who work with your patients? Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you for not asking the question about sleep because when we did that exercise before, that's the one that I went down on before <laughs> they even finished the sleep thing. Um, and if you ask about living with older children too, um, the answer is you just go to bed before them yeah. because you can't outlast. <laughs> no, I don't know if there are any parents of yes. teenagers in this room, yes. but I've given yes. up. <laughs> I asked they them to close the up. lights and put the milk away, but mm -hmm. that's pretty much right. it. <laughs> teenagers stay up late and they want to wake up late. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so like I was getting ready for this and I was all psyched because I was, I was reading about exercise and diabetes and I was thinking about, you know, exercise reducing insulin resistance and increasing muscle glucose uptake and I was sitting here this morning and I thought, oh my gosh, everyone's covering all of this already. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll tell you my, my personal story with this is, is rather recent. Our residents um, were doing a project about continuous glucose monitoring because we realized that this is more and more available to patients, um, but we're not prescribing it a whole lot. Um, and let's put prior authorizations aside. And so we obtained some and wore them for 10 days because the idea is, you know, if you try this yourself, then what will, will that help enhance the way you can talk about the experience to your patients? Um, and so I wore mine last week and I wore it on my run to work um, and I got to our clinic um, and I think I, I told Yandra and the rest of our amazing team that's shout out to them over here that my blood sugar actually went up to 190 um, while I was running and I was like running is putting me into this hyperglycemic state and so you know just I was thinking about how complex it must be mm -hmm. if you actually like I was doing this as a QI project if mm -hmm. I were living with diabetes and trying to figure out like do I eat before what do I eat how am I doing now in the middle of my run to Brooklyn I mean think about how hard that is yeah. um, and so it just it, it, it gave me some pause and I think that that you know, there's literature out there that shows that lifestyle, um, intensive lifestyle interventions work. Um, you know, there's a question, are the supervised exercise programs versus unsupervised exercise programs? And so how do we manage that? Because the patients who we take care of, and I think Yandra and Chrisanne alluded to this, you know, our, our Kings County patients take care of everybody regardless of their ability to pay. Mm -hmm. So that means like sitting down and talking to somebody about like, hey, well, how about, you know, you need to do resistance uh, twice a week, right, with some time in between and go to the gym or why don't you, you know, get on the treadmill, like that's not accessible to all of our patients. So what do we do at Kings County? Um, 
So I want to talk about a couple of things. One is like, how do we take, we realize that many of our employees are our patients. Um, we're all patients that was brought up this morning. So what are we doing for employees when we talk to them about, about uh, exercise? Because if you're talking about sleep, mm -hmm. then when you give the, what time did you say you got up this morning? 3.30 um, to get your nine miles in? Okay, all right. Um, so, you know, the, like how does that work? If you subtract seven hours, you're going to bed pretty early yeah. to make sure you got your sleep too. And so how do I talk to to folks who I work with who have young children at home. Um, and so we've tried to do different things, like how do you integrate this into your workplace? So we're not so sophisticated as to have treadmills at our desks um, yet, uh, but we are trying to you know, have a day a week where we go outside and we walk on the Wingate uh, Park track um, when it's nicer out. Uh, we also um, have a whole campaign, if anybody goes across the street to Kings County, to take the stairs. And I'm so excited about this campaign because this is really where you partner with primary care and your office of, of public relations. They made these great signs that are up there that encourage people, like one flight at a time, keep on going, you can do this. And so more and more of our team, most of us live on the seventh floor, um, and uh, more and more people I see are doing it. And we take time to chat in between, you know, a few flights. Um, but those are the sorts of initiatives that we've been trying to put into action. Um, we also, you know, having... Um, things that your patients can take part in that are accessible, um, such as a gym. I think that's a luxury that we have at Kings County. So we actually have a free gym for our patients and um, our employees can also work out there as well. And it's, it's during you know, working hours, like 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, but that's been wonderful to be able to talk about exercise where we have a trainer who can teach people. Because I have become, I was saying, I think I've aged into becoming a geriatrician somewhat <laughs> um, in my 10 years at Kings County. And so you know, people, some of my patients look at me and they're like, Dr. Lee, an elliptical machine? Like, what are you talking about? And so to be able to say, we have somebody here who can teach you how to use this so that you're comfortable and then you can come in on your own. And there's always supervision there. Um, and that's right down the hall from our lifestyle medicine program. Um, we're also trying to really uh, move our primary care providers to do something that was uh, mentioned this morning as, as one of the, um, for, for exercise pillars, is to do that fit prescription for exercise. So when you're in the primary care office, yes, we have 20 minutes, there's always, you know, we're agenda setting and trying to do some MI. And so how do you make sure that you're also screening people for their fitness, for their exercise activity, and saying that this is just as important, if not more important, than some of those other things that we're putting on the plate right now. Uh, so we, um, in conjunction with the uh, Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program here, so Dr. Reinhardt's GWIP project, um, have been giving out uh, resistance bands to our older adults when they're in the primary care practice. And uh, we had our team film a video, so we have seated exercises, because we were worried, you know, what are you worried about your patients, right? Falls, um, making sure that people can, we printed out instructions just in case people don't like to use their phones, some people prefer the videos. Um, and I had a patient who came in yesterday and she was wonderful. She brought her, she said, look what I carry with me. And she opened her purse and pulled out her resistance band and said whenever, she's a home health aide, um, and many of our patients work in people's homes. And she said, when my patient's asleep, I bring this out and this is what I do. Um, and so like these are the ways that we're trying to integrate exercise and physical activity into the lives of our patients, um, of our staff, and really try to improve things. You know, it's aerobic is important, obviously. Obviously, we talked about this morning, resistance is important. Also, flexibility and balance, um, especially in our older adults, because if we can prevent one fall, then we've done a good job that day. Um, so um, I, the last thing I'll say is uh, we building community and relationships. We've heard about that as part of our lifestyle medicine pillars. Uh, and so one thing we do with our residency, um, we do some volunteer work. So we spend time uh, volunteering with God's Love We Deliver. If you're familiar, I've seen them in Brooklyn a lot uh, recently. And so to really get our residents um, to understand what it takes to make these thousands and thousands of meals to serve them to medically, uh, medically necessary meals for New Yorkers every day. Uh, and so a number of our residents actually joined us not only to volunteer in the kitchen, but also to um, sign up for one of their fundraising runs. And so I got a bunch of my residents out running, um, and uh, one of them actually set a goal of SMART goal. I thought it was a little longer than a SMART goal, but he did it. <laughs> um, his SMART goal was going from the four-miler in November to the 
the Brooklyn half that was just a couple weeks ago, and I was volunteering at the water station at six miles, and I heard, Dr. Lee, um, and there he was doing it. So like, there's so many ways that we can engage people in community and in physical activity, and those are just a few of the things that we've been doing at Kings County. So thanks. That, that's great, thank you. Um, and then our final panelist, uh, Dr. Hughes, um, can you uh, please speak about uh, diabetic technology and uh, how it can reinforce lifestyle uh, plant-based nutrition? Sure, love to. I've been dying to. Uh, I'm gonna, at the risk of sounding a little bit like a dinosaur, work with me here. 39 years as a nurse, so what does that mean? That means that I was on a medical unit when the first blood glucose meter arrived at a hospital, okay? So in other words, I was using urine testing for our patients living with diabetes. And pre-diabetes, back then, and up until unfortunately recently, was still called borderline diabetes, which the words alone, very much into language, the words alone promoted no change. Because if you think about adults, they're not gonna put themselves on the wrong side of the fence, right? You're borderline, oh, that means I'm still, no, no, you've arrived. It's a real thing, it's like being a little bit pregnant, okay? <laughs> so those were the days where I started out. So looking at urine and the first blood glucose meter to now go into the present, having continuous glucose monitoring. But unfortunately, still only a few can afford it, right, covered under their insurance. So what's, what I'm really, proud of is a Catholic Health in our program, we have professional versions of the models that are on the market today. So regardless of the patient's ability to pay, we've purchased them. So individuals with pre-diabetes, we put a glucose monitor on them. Patients with diabetes that don't have their own personal, we put a gl glucose monitor on them. Because Adults don't like to be told what to do. So the day is coming back, well, tell me about your meal plan. Well, I would suggest that maybe we don't eat. It's so powerful. It empowers the person. If they look at it and they see in color what's happening to them during the day, right? Same thing with pre-diabetes. We have reversed and prevented type 2 diabetes by simply putting a continuous glucose monitor on an individual and letting them see the impact of their life, them as a whole person. They think we're putting it on to monitor their food. Oh, you're gonna see everything I'm eating. That's one aspect, but of course, it always comes to mind as the number one most important, right? But there's, we need to look at the whole person. So I tell them, no, it's about, yes, it's about your food. And they, they always say, you wanna hear what I'm, you wanna see what I'm eating. And I always add eating and drinking because many people, we see these spikes after breakfast and I'm saying, so tell me about what's going on at breakfast. And they'll say, no, I ate this and it'll sound beautiful. And I'll say, well, did you drink anything? Oh, well, I had like a glass or two of orange juice because they, they don't understand drinking and eating are two different things. They're, they're the same. They're going to impact blood sugars. Also being mindful, if you noticed, of how I approach that patient. When we say, when we look at the continuous glucose monitoring report, many of us that are used to using these reports and that are really feel that they're so valuable, we may make the mistake of saying that we find that one that has the least amount of variations because that causes complications down the road. So you want to look at the least amount of variations. And we used to say, myself included, well, this is your best day. Tell me about this day. We don't use those terminology anymore, that language, because that best day, what appears to be the best day, could have been your patient's worst day. And that happened when the patient said to me, oh, I didn't have any money for food that day. I was using whatever I had in the house, because they had food insecurities. So how did I make them feel when I said that was your best day? It wasn't their best day, that was their worst day of the week. So we're very mindful to say, tell me about this, tell me the story behind what I'm seeing here, this picture. And when we talk about sleep, and again, how people don't understand or appreciate the importance of it, I'll say, okay, tell me what happened in the middle of the night here, I see that your, your blood sugar went up, we have some variations here. And they'll say, well, I had to get up to go to the bathroom. And I'll look and say, as far as I know, in my 35 years in this field, that does not cause elevation in blood sugar. Oh, but I also had a snack. Okay, so you have to pass through the kitchen 
to get to the bathroom. No, the bathroom's on the, on the downstairs and I'm, my, my bedroom's on the upstairs. So you purposely went downstairs to get that snack before returning to bed. So, you know, we try to make some, make it in, enjoyable. We don't judge patients, but you want to get them to open up and then they laugh and they feel comfortable and they have a report and then they're going to tell us a lot of other things. But we also look at physical activity during the day. Well, what, look at here, what happened after dinner. But, oh, you went for a walk after dinner. You used one of the tools that we suggested and look how you brought that blood sugar down. So they're not making judgments about themselves. They're saying, oh, I had this, but look, I offset it by doing that walk or that jog or whatever. And now they feel empowered. And one last thing. We happen to, I have found these strategies to using continuous glucose monitoring that I feel really helps empower the patient. When we look at patients with pre-diabetes or diabetes, unfortunately, in traditional medicine, they're expecting to get yelled at when they go to the, to the provider. Your A1C is up, your A1C hasn't changed, your weight, weight hasn't changed, but, and they're, they're conditioned to that. So what I like to do, and, and I work with 16 other certified diabetes care and education specialists, what we like to do is we split that either 10 day or 14 day, depending on how, what monitor they're using, and we split it down and we bring them halfway through. So we put it on them and they come back either five days later or seven days later and we identify trends and patterns. We identify what are they eating? Tell me about your physical activity. Tell me about your sleep. Tell me about your stress. Stress raises blood sugar faster than any food you can put in your mouth. So we say, tell us about that. Let's look at these trends and patterns. Let's pick one thing to work on. Now they come back before we take this off, because remember, it's the prof professional version. They don't get to keep it. So now they come back, but the wonderful way of doing it, modeling it that way is they come back and now have the opportunity to see their impact. And now we get to pat them on the back. More importantly, they get to pat themselves on the back. I say, look at this. Well, and, and when you're, if you're used to looking at an AGP, um, profile of the CGM, which shows you um, like red, yellow, and green. You want less red, more green. Just keep it very simple, very colorful, very easy for the patient. Look at this, more green, less red. Look what you've done. You've improved this. And they, you can see them automatically sitting up better. They're proud of themselves. And they want to go back and do more now. Now they leave, oh, yeah, Lou, wait until you see me next time. Wait until you see my bro. <laughs> they become competitive with themselves. So using this technology truly empowers the whole person, not just food, but every aspect of what they're doing. And of course, integrating and replacing that traditional processed food with plant-based once they see it, they're like, oh, do you have an, maybe I'll do it for two meals this week. Then eventually, it becomes their lifestyle. So thank you for letting me share. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, the way you empower folks to... <laughs> they have such wonderful feedback from the unit to see how a walk or yeah. a, a midnight snack is how it changes things up for them. So uh, before we move on to the audience uh, being able to ask questions of, of uh, this expert group, do you all have anything else that you would like to add uh, based upon the questions that have been asked and, and anything that you want to respond to each other at I, this point? I think it's really important to meet your patient where they're at. I know we all said this, and that very small steps do matter. They really do matter. They give the patient um, confidence. They feel like they can do it. They feel um, more empowered to try something new, like a new recipe. Um, they hear maybe other patients, and they're, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm going to try and do that. That patient did something new. Really, really looking at those small steps, because they do matter, and they do add up. Thank you. Okay, so now I would like to call upon the audience if you have any questions uh, for any our, of our folks up here today. Anything about, uh, you know, sleep hygiene, uh, diet, uh, you know, patients monitoring themselves, uh, exercise, anything that you uh, that is of, of interest to you.
Hi, thanks so much for coming today, it was great. Um, my name is Sarah, I work in the ER here at Downstate. Um, I was actually talking to Linda, who um, trained me when I was on orientation a few years ago. Um, but I, I was talking with her and I was saying, I, I'm coming to this um, event and it's, <clears throat> I feel like it's really nice information about lifestyle changes um, and like plant-based health and all that stuff. But a lot of the patients that come in, I see DK all the time. This is like the extreme <clears throat> of diabetes. And if I'm starting to talk to these patients about plant-based health, like <clears throat> a lot of them are just you know, they're, they're sitting in the hospital bed ordering fried chicken. So for me to start talking to them about plant-based health, they're going to laugh in my face, right? So I was just talking with Linda, like how for these kind of extreme patients that maybe necessarily, like, I don't know, like, a, a lot of them seem like they're, they're not really willing to, you know, take ownership of their, of, of their health at that point. Like what, what are some tips that you might give to someone in my position um, to help them get, obviously they're not going to be, you know, um, eating a, plant, a fully plant-based diet the next day, but to maybe to start, you know, baby steps to get them to that point. Um, and also, my manager asked me to, like, when I come back to, to work um, for my shift, to some takeaway, like, some takeaway points for my co colleagues. Are there, do you have any, maybe, like, you know, elevator pitches or something for me that I can give to my colleagues? <laughs> <laughs> so I, maybe just to, to, to start, like it's really, it's a hard question, right? Um, you want to talk, like we're excited about something. We have somebody who's before us who maybe like that's not the right space for them to talk about things. Um, and I'll, I'll just tell you one thing that I've learned in our li lifestyle medicine uh, program, and you know some of my colleagues may have found the same. I'm seeing some patients who I've been taking care of for up to 10 years in my own primary care practice. Um, and as part of kind of our questions, like we ask what people like to eat, again, like, wow, amazing. What are, what's your favorite fruit or what's your favorite vegetable? We're also asking them questions about food insecurity. Um, so are there ever times, you know, when you bought food and it's run out and you were worried that you didn't have enough money to buy more? And I have found more patients who I thought I really knew answer positively to that screening question. And then, and it's just, it's really opened kind of a window into my own practice that I need to be more aware. So like getting to the root cause of why is it that somebody might be choosing some options for food than, rather than others, because of, I think access is a huge challenge. Um, and you know, so that's, that's something that like getting, getting to the bottom of it and then maybe trying to connect folks um, to a community health worker, to somebody, maybe somebody's eligible for SNAP benefits. And so once they can get that, would that enable them to be able to put a salad on their plate once a week? Like that could be huge. And I'll just add to this as well, nurse to nurse, DKA. You know, we know why someone goes into DKA, they didn't take insulin. Well, why could they not afford? We know there's been a lot of um, marketing and, and uh, you know, not news around affordability of insulin for many years now. So is it that they can't afford their medication? We always assume, oh, they're not compliant, which I don't like, we're not allowed to use that word anymore. They're not adherent. No, they're, they're not aware of what maybe they should do. I always tell them, my patients are not compliant. It's not that they're not compliant, not adherent. They haven't been educated. And give me an opportunity to help them, to speak to them. So looking at what caused the DKA, maybe that's not the appropriate time to talk about switching from fried chicken to plant-based. It might not, I'm gonna say it most likely is not, but you might get there. And on that note, I mean, I, I remember, you know, being so passionate about plant-based and talking to a bunch of um, new parents, moms and dads, healthy kids, ha happy futures, what I called my lecture. And I went on about how we want to raise this healthy generation. One person raised a hand. She said, I have a very limited income. I'm a mom of three children, single mom, and I can buy macaroni, five boxes of macaroni and cheese for a dollar. And I had to think of a comeback. So I wasn't prepared for that. Mm -hmm. My comeback was at the time, don't laugh. Like, well, don't add the chemical cheese part of it. Maybe just the pasta with some plant-based uh, plant margarine. And at least you're using it, but... That was, it's challenging. We don't have the answers to every situation that's gonna come up, but meeting the patient where they are and just getting to the, the root cause of what, what caused that DKA? Could we help in some way? Yeah, yeah to, to add to that, so 
something that is super important is listening to the patient and also having an approach of uh, like being very compassionate. As everyone is saying, it's just like, we don't know what's happening, right? So we have to respect their dietary like needs that they have. So like, why are they choosing those foods? So sometimes like it's not about, and th this is something that we always disclose to the patients, you guys are in control of the process. We are here just to give you some guidance. So, and we're going to cheer you up, but you have to do the work, right? So, and some of the patients are very receptive. Some of them are like, you know what? I'm, I'm just interested on these pillars of health. I'm not ready for like doing any nutrition changes. Like, and also try to always explain to your patients that this is not something that is happening at them, you know? This is not like, uh, so always explaining a little bit of like, what's the process behind it? What, what is this like happening? Like what is causing the disease, right? So I think that that empowers a lot of the patients because like, oh, saturated fat, oh, I'm, what, I'm, I never thought about eating fiber before, you know? Like, oh, what is this macronutrients or like vitamins and why do I need them? So I think that it's, it's having respect for the patient Oh, which is, is something that is going to empower them and is going to, uh, so some, something I would tell them, like, who likes to be told what to do? No one likes to be told what to do. When they understand, like, what are they putting into their bodies, when they understand and they can make the choices, if it's possible, because some of them, as everyone was saying, right, so they might not have the means of that. Like, they might rely on food pantries. And when they, sometimes they come to us and they tell us, you know what, like, uh, I'm, I want to take, uh, I don't know, for example, I want to use plant-based milk, but in my pantry they only give me cow's milk, right? So it's like, okay, so let's work with what you have. Like, what do you have at home? Always be curious about that. So every like, little single step that we can like, help them to be more planned forward. So even if not, it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be something that long term is going to help them to get into those goals to like, reduce their A1C or have a better lipid profile. So I don't know if you guys want to add anything. There are some, um, yeah, Plant Power Metro has a lot of resources and um, ACLM that Beth Frades was talking about, you could just kind of slip a, a flyer into their paperwork. Okay, uh, next question. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mihir. I'm here with my dad and my dad and mom both got diagnosed with prediabetes recently. So we're working on preventing that uh, from changing to diabetes to type two. Um, one thing I just wanted to echo the, the small steps that you mentioned. I think it's super powerful. There's this book by uh, Dr. B.J. Fogg from the Stanford Behavioral Sciences Lab called Tiny Habits. It was actually recommended yes. to me by Dr. Lori Marbus of Plant-Based mm -hmm. Telehealth. She shared it with me. She uses it with her patients. Really, mm -hmm. really powerful book um, for building habits. Mm -hmm. But my question. So um, it's about the, this like 10,000 steps a day has become really popular. And I have a suspicion, I'm gonna pick on my dad, he gets 10,000 steps every day, but I don't know if he's getting the cardiovascular benefit of that exercise. So I wanted to understand like, how to actually get that cardiovascular benefit and anything specifically related to getting the uh, blood glucose benefit as well from exercise versus maybe he, he walks around a lot while he's on the phone, gets steps in, but I don't know if the heart rate is getting into that higher zone. Thank yeah. you. So I, I mean, I think that there, there are different types of physical activity, and I always say like any kind of movement is great. Okay, so walking, it's never just walking, but walking is a wonderful thing. Then there's the next step to try to get to that moderate level where you're really trying to get your heart rate up. And so I'll tell my patients, you know, I still want you to be able to talk to the person who's next to you, um, but you should get sweaty. Your heart should be going. And that's really the level that the studies have looked at in terms of exercise and diabetes, where you're trying to reach 30 minutes, um, you know, most days of the week, so five times a week for moderate intensity exercise. And you can do a little bit less than that if you're doing vigorous um, exercise, but there. The, the, the vigorous exercisers out there you know, are not as, com as, as frequent as, as the moderates. Um, but really trying to talk about that because I also have many patients who tell me, but I, I'm moving, I'm walking, I work, I'm an electrician, I'm carrying stuff, I'm going up ladders. Like they are moving, they're not in that sedentary category, but they get to add more. And so 
they get to do it by running to the train, just like you said uh, earlier <laughs> today, right? Um, so getting off that bus two stops early um, and just kind of, you know, working a little harder to get there and pumping their arms, moving. Um, and so I feel like that's definitely a step. So part of the physical activity prescription for primary care, you know, it's the frequency and it's also the, the intensity that you're trying to look at at the time. I'd like to piggyback on that. Yeah. Uh, so there is a difference between daily movement. It sounds like your dad's doing a lot of da daily movement. That's great for general health. Uh, and then there's aerobic exercise, and there's strength exercise, and there's balance exercise. So it's what is he willing to do? Does he just, is he comfortable at daily movement level? And you want to increase that daily movement, so he's moving a tremendous amount, but he, he's a little apprehensive about exertion. A, a lot of people who haven't exercised feel uncomfortable with exertion. So where does he feel comfortable? Does he feel comfortable riding a bike or a stationary bike? Maybe he would feel a little more comfortable exerting himself a little more on a bike or you know, anything, anything that he likes, and it could be for 30 seconds. So maybe just increase his exertion for 30 seconds, whatever that is for him. So not really, uh, it's more of his, um, his own perceived exertion, right? Am I working harder than I was before? Is this a little harder than just a walk? Maybe he does that for 30 seconds in his walk. Maybe he walks a little faster for 30 seconds or 10 seconds and he goes back to his normal pace. Any, any kind of lift of a little more exertion will start to move him out of that daily movement and start to move him near that aerob aerobic capacity or even strength training, even doing something completely different. Uh, if he's not doing any strength training, that would be really good with bands at home or a gym, really start to diversify the type of activity he's doing, and that would be super helpful too, because the combined aerobic and strength training for diabetes is tremendous. And, and from the physical therapy standpoint, um, a person needs to do what's called progressive resistive exercise. So if you walk the same distance every day, bicycle the same route every day, you get better, but then you, you plateau. Mm -hmm. So uh, if he can walk with you or another young family member and, you know, and just have him walk fast for a block and then slow down. Um, and uh, so that's called interval training. He could also try going up and down a flight of stairs. Mm -hmm. If you live in an apartment building, go up a flight of stairs, or in, if you have a house with stairs. Uh, and go with him the first time if he doesn't normally do stairs. You know, in apartment buildings, sometimes you can just do elevators and never do stairs. Um, so that's also another good way, in addition to, you know, certainly the gym, the exercise bands, uh, you know, weights. And in, in older individuals, they really need to work on strengthening of all the leg muscles mm -hmm. because that's what's going to prevent them from uh, losing their balance, mm -hmm. falling, and, and fracturing. Increase quality Can I just of add life. one thing to that also, too? When we're teaching about physical activity in our classes, and we'll say, what is the most powerful medication but yet most underused in either pre-diabetes or diabetes? And patients will usually say, oh, she must be thinking about insulin. It's physical activity. Okay. It's the strongest medication, but yet mostly underused. So using that, but again, it's that biofeedback, getting that, re, you know, looking at a sensor, looking at a blood glucose meter. And in pre-diabetes, this summer, because pre-diabetes you're not going to be covered for a continuous glucose monitor, but this summer there'll be an over-the-counter one. So anyone will have access to a continuous glucose monitor. And you can go for that, be busy during the day, but then what I call walk with purpose, seeing the difference between what your blood sugar does with being mm -hmm. active, but then walking with purpose. Mm -hmm. And we also teach too, when I'm doing exercise classes, well, not, not exercise classes, but teaching about exercise, I'll have like a top or a dreidel, and I'll spin it, and I'll be dancing, and then I stop, and everyone will see the dreidels going. That's the impact of physical activity. Mm -hmm. By doing that, you've engaged your metabolism long after you mm -hmm. stopped, and that, gives, that leaves them with such an impression that they want to then do it, because they can visually see it. Thank you.
And, and we need to wrap this up now, but I just had one other thought. Uh, the other thing that uh, physical therapists do with patients with diabetes, if they're going to walk long distances, we want to make sure that their footwear is very mm -hmm. comfortable, yeah. mm -hmm. and you want to do mm -hmm. a skin check of the feet to make sure that there's no uh, rubbing of the skin, because that's something that's very important as well. So I want to thank you panelists. This was thank very uh, interesting. And thank you for the members of the audience who asked uh, interesting questions that continued our conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, thank you. That was very interesting. Great pointers. So next we're going to hear a little bit about what makes uh, people with diabetes in central Brooklyn perhaps unique, maybe different from the way that diabetes presents itself in other parts of the country. Um, so I'm delighted today to welcome a real scientific expert in diabetes care who's um, on the faculty here at SUNY Downstate, Dr. Marianne Banerjee. She's a professor of medicine and chief of the endocrine division and along with colleagues, she characterized a different subtype of diabetes that's been termed flatbush diabetes or ketosis-prone diabetes, um, and also has been looking into insulin-sensitive and insulin-resistant subtypes and long-term remission in type 2 diabetes. So very interested to hear what she has to say about the way diabetes looks here in Brooklyn. So Dr. Banerjee, I welcome you. Well, thank you for the introduction. I'm looking for the box to stand on. <laughs> but it's on wheels. <laughs> so. OK, so I think, uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. And it's really a pleasure to be here. And I was there for your, uh, your post-lunch event. And it seemed like there was an amazing amount of energy in, in that enormous uh, public health room. So uh, that was really terrific. So anyway, the topic, t title topic is Flatbush Diabetes, and um, these are my disclosures. And this is an outline, Flatbush Diabetes or Ketosis-Prone Diabetes, the phenotype and the promise of the genotype. And so I know all of you know what's diabetes, but I wasn't certain when I started this. So uh, diabetes is really excessive sugar. If untreated, it leads to complications, which you all know about and that treatment of multiple risk factors improves complications. The second thing is we're a little over 100 years after the discovery of insulin, but we still have a very large number of people with diabetes, 100 million adults, 30 million who know about it, and are diabetic, and 84 million with prediabetes, and about 10% plus or minus of adults in Brooklyn have diabetes. And the interesting thing to me has been is that the treatment of risk factors to prevent complications are variably effective. Only 21% are fully controlled after all these many years of really working at it. And so that um, led me, or led many of us, to think that the traditional forms of diabetes, type 1 and 2, can't possibly be adequate to describe all the stuff that's going on out there in the world. And there must be a great deal of variations in diabetes or heterogeneity. Most diabetes. Uh, is type 2 diabetes, over 90%. And type 1 diabetes is about 5.8%. And then there's a sliver of others, which are largely genetic. And the question is, how much heterogeneity is within the type 2 diabetes space? And one form of that kind of heterogeneity has to do with flatbush diabetes or ketosis-prone diabetes. We all know about LADA, or latent autoimmune diabetes of adults, which is another variant of type 1 diabetes. And so the focus really is on flatbush diabetes. And I start with a case from the county of 30 years ago, which is very similar to some of the cases that were described earlier in the morning, of a 48-year-old black woman whose glucose came in uh, at 800 with a pH of 7, who was treated with insulin and fluids, had no triggering factors to precipitate this, had a family history of diabetes, and was sent home on a kind of insulin which you don't use anymore called NPH insulin and regular twice a day. You had to mix it on your own. And she came back to clinic and had stopped her insulin, and her sugars were 90, even though we thought she was non-adherent. Um, <clears throat> and six months later, we discovered that her A1C was 5.8 or normal. She had not lost any weight. 
and her BMI was 28, so she was neither thin nor very obese. And so this led to the question, is, question, three years later, why did she recover and why was her A1C still normal on no medicines for diabetes and 15 years later she was still the same. So she had a long-term recovery after this. And I should say incidentally for all the plant-based people here, she did change her diet and it turned out she had a vegetable garden in central Brooklyn for which I used to bring her bags of manure from upstate. And uh, <laughs> we would get tomatoes in return in the summer. And um, so why did she recover is the question and there's still no answer and we're looking for it. So the first present, the f so our little first study was 12 men and nine women, 43 years old, blood pH of 718, which is very acidic or like vinegar. And she had, only two people had precipitating factors and 19 out of the 21 were all new onset. Our initial treatment of these patients was insulin from anywhere from three to two years, three months to two years, and they included lifestyle education. And it was brand new then at the county. It was 12 weekly classes on diet, physical activity, and medication management. And their subsequent treatments was quite varied. Some people ended up on insulin, others on sulfonylureas, and still others on diet alone. So it seems as though in retrospect now, that we did do a lot of lifestyle education then, and if people went to class, their diabetes went away completely. If they didn't go to class, only 5% went into remission. So something happened in those cl uh, lifestyle classes. So just to summarize a lot of data, I just put it up here, and then we'll explore one or two of these, is that in Flatbush diabetes, when they first come in, they don't make any insulin at all uh, when they're sick, uh, but their insulin secretion improves, their insulin resistance is very common. Diabetes antibodies are absent, so they're unlikely to be type 1. Their glucose tolerance test, when you do them when they're doing well, shows either normal to mild diabetes off all diabetes medicines. And the A1C is normal or pre-diabetic. And weight loss, in this case, does not explain this phenomenon of reversal. And usually it occurs in new onset diabetes presenting with severe DKA or hyperglycemia. Flatbush diabetes has many names. As you know, many people have many names. Mom, dad, brother, sister. These are all the variations that it comes with and reflects the places of origin. The explanation for why this happens is still unknown, but this is a shopping list of what could be the, the causes of this, such as counter-regulatory hormones, autoimmunity, insulin deficiency, and other issues, including genetics. In analyzing people, looking at um, beta, uh, autoimmunity and residual beta cell function to try and come up with an explanation as to why this reversal happens, uh, the group in, um, in Baylor looked at a group over there and discovered that there were really, if you presented with DKA, there were four different versions. The version that we're looking at are 50% of the group with negative antibodies and positive beta cell function. There are other groups in here, such as 17% have positive antibodies and negative beta cells. Those are classic type 1s. And then there are these groups in here that we really don't quite understand why they are the way they are. So there's heterogeneity built into just the DKA patients. I'm going to skip this one. And what we find also is that the, from the time they present, um, where their plasma insulins are very flat, to three months later where they have a great big rise in insulin production, whether they're obese diabetics with ketoacidosis or simply obese individuals with hyperglycemia. And so in flatbush diabetes, insulin secretion improves. And that's a clear feature of it. In the Bronx, what does it mean when you pay new onset patient presents with DKA? One third of all of DKA nowadays in the ER is type two and three out of five patients, or 60%, presenting with DKA as their initial manifestation also have type two. And if you happen to be African-American, obese, or older than the age of 40, the chances are even higher. 70% are type two. So just to summarize this bit, DKA and type two diabetes really features the improvement of insulin secretion. Is it clinically relevant? I'm gonna skip through this very fast because my time is short. Um, and really this leads us to the notion of remission in new onset type 2 diabetes. What would it be like if you presented with diabetes and then it all went away? 
And I think that's what plants do, do and also what this particular approach does. So we defined a remission. And we asked, how long does it last once you're in remission? And it looks, it looks like for seven or eight years, if you follow these patients, 50% are still in remission at 39 months, which is over three years with a normal A1C and no medicine whatsoever. For it. So it's a very substantial reversal to a very stable physiologic state. And you can take this state and prolong it with a little bit of medication, such as metformin and citagliptin, and it's better than doing nothing or giving them placebo. Um, you can create remissions in new-onset diabetes patients by simply giving them this cocktail that we had of intensive insulin tra treatment and diet and exercise, and they will recover. And I'm just going to show you one slide of that. Within three weeks to three months, most of the people who are going to recover do recover if you give them this little combination of inputs. We don't quite know what all these inputs are doing. But it does happen, and we have never really developed this as a form of focused treatment of all our new onset diabetes patients. And what you see in the process is that the insulin recovery happens very nicely um, with uh, an increase in the C peptide to glucose ratio uh, being quite a bit higher than people who never go into remission, but they all do recover to some extent. I'm going to skip this uh, because I'm really short of time. Glucose toxicity uh, was shown in Japanese with DKA. The division opens and the prevalence of DKA onset in type 2 in Japanese kids increases. It's paralleled by soft drink, drink, uh, drinks and vending machines and pet bottles, and nobody's changed any weight. So the question is, is this glucose toxicity and is this why they develop diabetes? And this business can be switched on and switched off. This is a Turkish study of a very small number of people whom they put in the hospital for continuous insulin treatment. Some people develop um, remissions very early on and stay there for five years. Others go in and out of remission. And every time they go out, they get another two weeks of treatment, and then they're back in for another couple of years. And so uh, the question really is, this, is very, uh, this can be seen all over the world. And the uh, national societies have now decided that remission is an entity, which is a good thing. And the question is, why does it matter? From something called the look-ahead study, which was an intensive lifestyle study, there were lower complications, even if remission was transient, 40% heart disease and 40% renal disease. What's next is discovering the switch that turns diabetes on and off. And so that's the phenotype. And we're now looking for the genotype in an NIH trial to study atypical diabetes with uh, atypical diabetes from a genetic point of view and it's called the Radiant Study, and we ask everybody out there to find people who look atypical, and they can be put in the study long distance online, sign consent, and get their genetics, genetics organized. So with that, I'm going to thank you all for listening, and have a wonderful day. Oops. Yeah. So in this particular variant of diabetes, is the, so the treatment is the short-term, like, insulin. And I, and I was just kind of wondering, what proportion, what proportion of, the, um, of the patients that you see in, in the Brooklyn area falls under this category? Is this very common? Seems that, it, seems, it seems very common when we're in clinic, but I really don't know the facts. And maybe we need the School of Public Health to help us figure out how to figure it out. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. And for our last but certainly not least uh, panel presentation today, um, we're going to be talking about final action steps. So the panel's called Making It Happen, Approaches to Dietary and Lifestyle Change in Clinical and Community Settings. And for this one, we're going to be led by a faculty member from our School of Public Health, um, Amy Afable, who is our Associate Dean for Community Engagement. And uh, for over 14 years, Dr. Afable's research has critically examined conceptual frameworks used to understand health disparities and health inequities. Her work has documented the declining health advantages with increasing stay among U.S. immigrants and has questioned the validity of the healthy immigrant paradox. She has a growing research program in community-engaged approaches to the development of urban health interventions. 
and she's currently co-leading two NIH studies that use community-engaged um, implementation science frameworks. She is going to be joined today by representatives from um, plant-powered Metro New York, um, from the New York City Department of Health, and I'm sorry that I don't have my, my paper up here with me. Who is Live, Dr. Duper from Live Light, Live Right. So I would like to welcome you all up to the stage for our last panel. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for staying this whole time. Um, and thank you, Beth, for introducing us. We're going to flip the script a little bit and hopefully even address some of the earlier questions uh, that came up, in particular, you know, what are the challenges in the real world to integrate lifestyle modification into our daily lives and at a higher level, at, you know, at the population level. And so, um, you know, as Beth mentioned, I am a health disparities, health equities researcher. And so, you know, the theme of this, of this panel is really to understand lifestyle medicine or lifestyle modification, which is the goal of, um, uh, uh, of the uh, lifestyle medicine, uh, what are the challenges and how do we approach a solution from a so social ecological perspective, right? And so um, I didn't hear a lot about social determinants of health today, and so we're really going to tackle uh, that, those issues um, in our discussion, in our panel. And so I am delighted to present, you know, our three panelists, and I have asked each of them to uh, <clears throat> present some slides to give a little sense of who they are, but also what are the resources and what are the models of care for chronic disease and management that their organizations are promoting and um, offering as a resource. So I guess we'll begin first with Liana. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it's great to be here. And keep your eyes open, because I know you're starting to have that decline, but <laughs> hopefully it'll be lively. OK, so I'm Leanna Levine Reisner. Um, I thank you for coming over to our table at the networking hour. It's great to speak with many of you. Um, I'm a co-founder and the network director of Plant Powered Metro New York. I personally got into this work um, trying to feed my children and wondering how to keep them healthy. And in the process of making dietary change, I reversed the symptoms of endometriosis, which no healthcare practitioner had ever spoken to me about in regards to food. And I was pleasantly surprised that I also um, had a very healthy weight third pregnancy um, after having two very heavy pregnancies, thanks to what I think is due to dietary change, um, and a lot of great postpartum benefits as well. Um, so uh, Plant Powered Metro New York, for those who haven't heard the spiel, we are a community-driven organization that is promoting plant-based nutrition in the community, and we're looking at all different sorts of ways of helping people with behavior change. So it's not just telling people that plants are effective for their health. It's also giving them the tools to uh, learn in a way that feels comfortable. Um, we're not there to preach, we are there to guide. And then to give them the next step, which is what are my take home um, activities that I need to do? So whether it's going to the market and looking differently at uh, what's available at the produce stand or in the grocery store, being able to read labels, being able to know how to cook in your home. And we do not cut corners. We teach about a plant-exclusive approach, uh, knowing that anybody can add more chicken to their dish if they want, or they can um, put a lot of extra calories on through oil if they'd like, but we teach oil-free nutrition. We teach in a way that is giving them an ideal vision of where they can go, and that way, uh, they can make choices about how far they'd like to go. Um, in our programming, and maybe I'll advance the slides, our general, this is a mission, um, we are there to catalyze a movement for change with diverse local communities, and so we have a network of educators and volunteers and chefs and healthcare professionals who we deploy all over the region to do um, training and education and to pro provide support and community. Um, and through that, we have assembled a really wonderful and very multicultural team, um, people who have personally made change and who are able to be ambassadors within their communities. You've met some of our folks here today. Um, we have two mentor three mentors in the audience, Lisa and Enrica and Rotasha. 
um, and a few of you who've participated in our Jumpstart programs, which I'll talk about next. Um, just very briefly, like the theoretical framework for what we do, we're trying to get at behavior change uh, in service to health change. And so we provide a variety of different activities uh, that first raise awareness about what plant-based nutrition is uh, and help people to get curious about it through storytelling and through um, a connection to the evidence. But then we go deeper through education, just learning without any commitment and empowerment being the next step where we have activities that guide people toward uh, making changes to improve their health. And once they've gotten to know how to, do, how to do this, of course, there's the support element, which is how do we support people in uh, further um, in, you know, making the, a deeper commitment to eating a whole food plant-based diet, but also uh, making the tweaks to, to help improve over time. Um, so I'm going to speak briefly about our Jumpstart program, and then um, we can dive into a, a little bit more in the, in the panel discussion. So we have our Plant Power Jumpstart program. Uh, we've been really happy to work with Downstate over the past three years to study the program. Uh, so we have a little bit of data on it now, thanks to the work of uh, graduate student Ayana Basson. Um, our, the, plant the Plant Power Jumpstart, we are running it now in English and in Spanish. Um, and here's the context for it. We offer a virtual program, so we deliver it online, uh, although we're about to do one with, uh, in, in person at Downstate this summer for people who've received a kidney transplant as a separate study. But our general programs will be, are open to the public and are, uh, we, you're, we're getting people from many different backgrounds into the program. We are recruiting heavily from community organizations and healthcare organizations that we have connected with over the course of the past few years. Um, and we do get people who join from outside of the region because it's online and people can join from anywhere. So we have people from the West Coast and we've even had somebody from England in the program. Um, we also um, create accessibility by offering tiered pricing. There are certain programs that we run that are grant funded that are either free or very low cost. Our general programs, we offer tiered pricing so that there's a discounted rate for folks to join if they don't have the ability to pay the full price. Um, and we ended up with a very female population. Um, I think it's about 90 to 95% um, who are female who join. Um, I think you all probably know why that might be. Um, but also there's a, a lot of race racial and socioeconomic diversity. And I think that's in part uh, thanks to the uh, relationships that we have with certain kinds of community organizations who are encouraging their um, constituents to join, also our own mentors and people who we have been in the Jumpstart before are great ambassadors to bringing in new people. Um, so we end up with a, a really nice diverse population. And we have anywhere from 60 to 200 people in a program. We just did a program in April in Spanish that had 60 people. Um, we're right now doing a program with New York City Health and Hospitals employees, uh, thanks to their sponsorship, with 200 people. And usually our English programs land somewhere in the middle. Uh, so that's the context. And then what do we do with them? The inputs are weekly educational sessions through Zoom. Um, we have uh, usually somewhere between an hour and a half to three hours of programming through Zoom each week. And then uh, we have peer mentorship. So that's what, like the secret sauce of the program. Everybody who's in the program gets put into a small group that's led and facilitated by either one or two mentors who we've trained from the community. And they're not health coaches. They're not, they don't have the credentials that Chris Ann has, but they're people who have lived experience with the lifestyle. And so they guide people on the path and answer their questions and feel WhatsApp um, questions and share um, food photos um, in between sessions. We offer, we offer a lot of resources and recipes through a program app. We take people who are local on market tours in person, which are optional. And uh, we also do make sure we address medication safety. Although we're not a healthcare organization, we have medical advisors from our our advisory board who help us um, to do some intake and make sure the folks coming in who are on diabetes medication and on hypertensive medications know what they need to do to monitor those medications because we're not gonna be responsible for that, they have to be responsible for it. And the last thing is we bring produce um, to those who are food, food insecure. So we work with a produce delivery company and make sure that folks um, can have the option to opt in to receive a box during the program. And of course, should we um, get more resources to run these programs, we'd offer 
more than one box because it would be great to give them produce once a week. Um, so that's the program in a nutshell, probably more time than I, sh than I should have taken, but we'll move on from No, there. Leanna, that was perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you, Leanna. And next we'll hear from Sarita, Dr. Sarita Duper, who is the executive director and founder of Live Light, Live Right, a childhood obesity management program. Thank you so much, Amy, Beth, and for all the organizers uh, for the invitation. Um, my background is also kind of, I just stumbled upon uh, this uh, sort of career path and it's become a big part of my life. I'm a pediatric cardiologist, again, like Dr. Rosenfeld in the pediatric space. Um, did all my education um, first in India and then here at, in the US and studied in, uh, did my fellowship at, uh, in New York City and then I moved to Brooklyn. And in the first few years of my career here in Brooklyn as a pediatric cardiologist, where we learned nothing about nutrition, nothing about saving patients who become adults, um, all we knew is was congenital heart disease. And then though I have many success stories, my career started with tragic stories. Um, the first two patients which are referred to me, which really made me start this program, were two kids who were over 300 pounds, and they were referred to us to rule out heart disease because they were breathing too heavy and they were getting shortness of breath. Both of them ended up having a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy, which is very large hearts, and uh, they had to go on a transplant list to Columbia. Unfortunately, both of them were refused because of their obesity. So they were refused to get heart transplants and they passed away. Both of them passed away. We had plaques in their memory. And it always brings back a very sad feeling. And then after that, I started looking at why is this happening? And uh, more and more patients were referred to me in this neighborhood. I was at Brookdale Hospital first and then at Downstate. They were coming in with uh, hypertension, pre-diabetes, diabetes. And I'm talking about the late 90s, early 2000s. I'm talking about 20 <laughs> plus years ago. And at that time, obesity was not even on the surface for kids. And uh, we started this program, Live Light, Live Right, using community uh, coalitions to see what we could do to treat the actual underlying cause for all these conditions and not just treat them with medications for their blood pressure or medications for their lipids, which we couldn't for kids. And so now Live Light, Live Right was funded by the Robin Hood Foundation for many years and the New York State of, uh, Department of Health. And we were able to create our own 501c3 organization. And Dr. Fable and the School of Public Health have really helped us promote this at Downstate and other neighborhoods. It basically is a four-part model. Uh, it's, but what drives it is understanding obesity as a disease. And when I say understanding obesity as a disease, I mean severe obesity. I don't mean anybody who's trying to lose weight. That's not a disease, that's, that's you know, the desire to be thin, so we have a big difference between that. So anyone with a BMI of over 35 with comorbidities, that's our major population. And it's a chronic progressive re relapsing disease. So while we've talked about all the six or seven or eight or nine pillars which we keep adding, and we do all of those in our practice, this is still a relentless disease. In spite of doing all the, all the, all, all the lifestyle modifications, sometimes, you know, some studies have shown there's just a three to five percent improvement um, in intensive lifestyle modification. We can show, all, like, like you said, you could show the good signs, you could show the bad signs, but people who are 35 BMI and above, no matter how much intervention you do, they lose the weight and they gain it back. So this chronic relapsing disease is what we're trying to understand, and it affects the physical, mental, and the mental health trajectory of the children and adolescents. So it's a pioneering healthcare model focused on childhood obesity prevention, but mostly multi-level treatment, both primary level, secondary, and tertiary. And we serve mostly um, the catchment areas, Brooklyn, central Brooklyn, 37% of our patients in the federal, under the federal poverty level. Majority of them are black kids, 86%, and Latinos, 12%. Uh, we offer completely in, complete in-depth evaluation, and I'm a board-certified obesity specialist now, like they have the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. We also started this American Board of Obesity Medicine in 2012, when I first took my boards, and the first time it happened, I was just waiting for that so I could get certified and not be talked about just as a pediatric cardiologist, because I do not treat my patients like a cardiologist. I treat them as an obesity medicine specialist, give them a holistic approach. Um, we do body composition, fitness assessment, individual care and nutritional counseling with a certified nutritionist, but I will, we will direct the nutritionist based on what the needs of the patient is. It's not like one size fits all. Someone has a high hemoglobin A1C, someone has a high dyslipidemia, someone has high triglycerides. 
Um, we then offer everybody virtual or in-person trainer-led exercise classes. They're at the Brownsville Recreation Center, and they were at the Flatbush YMCA's, but after COVID, that stopped. Uh, we have weekly cooking demos and nutrition classes which teach them how to use all the things you've talked about today, all the th new, new ingredients, new nutrition, ways to bring plant-based foods inside, ways to substitutes. And then, just recently, over the last two years, we have advanced treatment for severe disease, which is chronic and progressive. We've used weight loss medications or weight loss surgery if necessary, and definitely that has helped some of the kids who are struggling with obesity. Mm -hmm. We have community engagement, uh, powerful uh, uh, partners in this field which help us uh, do what we ought to do. And again, this is just showing you the model stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, all working together. The green, the green boxes tell you that uh, stage one and stage two is exactly lifestyle modification, exercise, diet, exercise, diet, um, mental health, all, all the pillars we talked about, sleep. And the next two pattern, uh, uh, the slides are uh, stage three and stage four are intensify the treatment. Don't wait. They say pediatricians should start the treatment as soon as they see the child is getting obese. Don't wait. This will go away. This is puppy fat. This is this. It, 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 just start your treatment straight away and do what you have to do and uh, multiple layering approaches. That's my contact information and thank you again. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Juper. Can you just um, comment, or I don't know if you clarify if the resources that you provide, the, f the exercise uh, activities and the cooking classes and the workshops, are they free yes. to the Only the medical, uh, medical visit, thank you for reminding me, only the medical visit was uh, covered by insurance, and if they, whatever the insurance, most of us are Medicaid managed care. So, you know, it's really not uh, much to cover. Uh, the rest of it uh, is now supported by friends and family because it's a 501c3, so everything is free for the patients. But, of course, we would provide them much more when we had the grant from Robin Hood Foundation. We were providing much more, many more classes, but uh, the grant <coughs> lasted 14 years. We're very thankful for them, and then COVID came and monies went off to other poverty beings. So if anyone knows who can, would like to support, please let, any, uh, let us know, but it's free for them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duper. And finally, we have Maggie VH. She is uh, the Brooklyn Director of Health Equity and Capacity Building at the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness at the New York State Department of Health and, Men uh, health and Mental Hygiene. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I work for the Health Department. We are in the Bedford office of the Bureau of Brooklyn Neighborhood Health. That's in Bed-Stuy. Uh, we mostly focus on Brownsville, Bedford-Stuyvesant, East New York, and uh, Bushwick, although we do a fair amount of work in East Flatbush because there's some um, maternal mortality and high rates of diabetes here that we've talked about before. And our main goal is to um, eliminate health equities and health disparities that exist in these neighborhoods. Um, so just bringing it back a little bit, this day today has been really enjoyable for me because it's been on one-on-one -on -one clinical and patient medicine, which is very much different from the world that we work in. So when we think about public health, we're looking at how do you change the life expectancy for 8 million New Yorkers. And uh, there were gaps in life expectancies uh, for New Yorkers before COVID. And as you can see in this map, the life expectancy has dropped dramatically uh, during COVID um, and after COVID. And one of the things that I really want to talk about that we haven't really touched on a lot today is how environmental environment drives uh, life expectancy and health outcomes. And so we know during COVID, black and Hispanic people uh, died at disproportionate rates. And we know that this is because they this is because people had jobs, they had to be out in the community more, there were less protective factors. And then even when COVID vaccination became available, um, oftentimes COVID vaccines and COVID vaccine bans were placed in communities that were more convenient, where there was more traffic versus the communities that had the lowest rates of vaccination, which just kind of exacerbated the issue and the challenges and uh, created uh, disproportionate equity issues. Um, and so this is where you can see the gap here, and you can really see the, um, who bore like, the brunt of the burden of COVID, and even before COVID, different chronic diseases. Um, 
To what I was speaking about before, you know, COVID, uh, chronic disease and premature mortality uh, doesn't happen just randomly. It doesn't happen. And we've talked a little bit about genetics. We've talked about different lifestyle choices, which all matter and are all incredibly important. Um, but what we also know is that it has to do with like structural racism and like city investment. And so where money is inve invested, where are there the most parks, where are the most grocery stores, what schools have PE, what schools have gyms, even the New York City Department of Education, they have excellent school food, but some schools have kitchens that have space and capacity to chop up the food and prep it nice and hot. Other schools are just warming kitchens. And so the quality of food and the quality of resources that children and people across New York City varies dramatically. And you can see that in this map. Um, the three circles there represent kind of the areas that are three uh, uh, offices, bureaus of neighborhood health equity work, uh, Queens, uh, Harlem, and South Bronx. Wait, no. Central. Brooklyn, Harlem, South Bronx. We're trying to open an office in Queens. Uh, is, is anyone from the mayor's office still here? I was going to pitch this. <laughs> yeah, they were like, you should, you should, they're like, oh, we should talk to the, your Queens person. I'm like, we've been trying to get a Queens office, but I was like, I don't know, I'm going to get in trouble for that. So hopefully they're not listening online stream. Um, and then this is just a circle. We, this is diabetes. We could do this with high blood pressure. We could do this with HIV. We could do this with maternal mortality. We can do this all day long. Um, and these, if for folks taking pictures, these are also available on EpiQuery online, these maps. Um, and we just, again, showing that the disease burden is concentrated in certain neighborhoods. And it's concentrated in certain neighborhoods because of the resources that are spent and poured into the community. And uh, you know, the, the other thing that, that always gets me too with like the, the food, we talk a lot about money and cost and access to food, but one of the key things is, is that when you live so far out, you gotta commute to work and you come back and you get back at 6.15 or 6.30 and you got a choice to help your kids with the homework, make sure they get to bed on time or stop and grab food on the way home and the healthy food options aren't always there. Um, and something that we always hear when we come to uh, communities and we talk about food access is just the desire to have fewer fast food restaurants in, community, in, in communities um, with high burdens of diabetes and more cheap, accessible, healthy food that you can grab on the, on the way home. So it's not always pov like lack of money, it's just a lack of time, time and resources. Before you change that, uh, yes. can I just no. wanted to, I, for the, I don't know if everyone could see the numbers, but you know, it's going up to almost 19% in, is that East, is that South Bronx? It's the South Bronx, yeah. And around 17% <coughs> here where we're sitting, um, which is markedly higher than the national rate of 11.4%. Um, and also, I was asking Maggie uh, before the panel whether these are based on self-report or not, and apparently they are, so mm -hmm. you wanna clarify? So basically, this is an Ooh. underestimate of diabetes in New York City. So I just want everybody to aware, you know, it's, it's much higher here compared to the national aggregate average, which, and that 11.4% is, is not only based on self-report, it's based on NHANES, which actually goes and collects blood and diagnoses diabetes. So um, we're really uh, disproportionately affected here. Yep. And, and I just wanted to apply, uh, flag too, like all these neighborhoods are also have hypergentrification. So for like Bed-Stuy, one of the neighborhoods we work in, and like when I started working there in 2000, I was a little around 2010, 2011, there was a, maybe I started 2012, 2013, but uh, the last data we have is 2010. It was like 94% black or Hispanic, and now it's like 50%. So this data gets delayed. And what's one of the things that happens is that the, people who are black and Hispanic in the neighborhoods are getting even fewer resources because when you look at the overall numbers, uh, the, like this happened with COVID, this is my work, this is my job, this is our team, we look, we're like bed it has got like an 88% vaccination rate, we're gonna focus on Weeksville, we're gonna focus on Brownsville, like East New York, like these other neighborhoods that are struggling, and then they disaggregated the data by race, and bed actually for black and African American people had the lowest uh, rate of vaccination in New York City, and this was because that looked fine. And so when you were looking to focus where to put resources, you didn't think to look there. So this is something the health department we're also working on is to make sure our sampling reflects the hypergentrification and the displacement that's happening um, in, the, uh, in, in neighborhoods that have been historically black, African-American, or Hispanic. Um, uh, so, that, oh, so this is, oh, it's green. Okay, so this is the Diabetes Health Equity Initiative. I actually really like this color. Um, this was, um, so this is a little different than I put it in, but it ended up matching. So as I mentioned before, one of the things that we think about in, um, in our work in public health is we're trying to think about how do you scale this? So when I hear these lifestyle interventions, when I hear all of these things that are happening, 
this is fantastic. It's fan all doctors, all clinicians should be working with their patients that way. How do we reach a million New Yorkers? How do we reach two million New Yorkers? How do we make sure every single person in New York City and even across the country has access to lifestyle interventions? Um, and so what we decided to focus on um, are funds that you heard me talking about COVID. The funds that are supporting this money are public health core funds that were initially um, funds used for COVID. And so once COVID kind of finished, we looked at COVID recovery funds and how do you address chronic disease? How do you, how do you eliminate the burden of preventable early deaths due to diabetes, hypertension, and the different chronic diseases? And so we decided to focus on, we, like my team, decided to focus on diabetes. And we wanted to develop a network of evidence-based diabetes self-management classes that's consistent, predictable, and accessible to all who live in bed -Stuy. We wanted to focus on one specific neighborhood. One of the things that we learned during COVID that you kind of knew before, but with COVID we got a lot of data, was that when you try to be in all places at the same time, it's really difficult to do interventions in three, four, five, six, fifty places. And if you can just focus in one area in one community and go deep for like a few months or even a year, you can really have a population level impact. Um, diabetes self-management classes have been shown to be as effective as the medication metformin. They're, five, they're workshops that consist of five classes, and people who finish the classes have similar outcomes to if they were prescribed the medication metformin. Um, and then the other thing that we wanted to make sure is that everyone in, in the neighborhood we decided to focus on was Bed-Stuy are aware of the classes. And, and the reason for this is that oftentimes in public health, we like want to reach like this certain population. We're really, you know, in our minds, we're really targeting 45 to 64 year old people um, for a whole bunch of reasons that there's other slides on. I'll talk about at some other point, but um, not today. Uh, but there, um, but you want to focus on those people, but. We know that in the communities that we serve, in all of our communities, it's often your spouse, your sister, your mother, your brother, uh, who wants you to go and take these classes. And we also know too that, like, I think one in three households have diabetes, have someone in them living with diabetes or pre-diabetes. And so you don't know when you don't know when you're going to get diagnosed. But when you get diagnosed, you want to be like, oh, I just got that postcard in the mail, or I saw something at the bodega. I think I got an email about a diabetes class because that's the time that you're most likely to take the classes upon diagnosis. And I'm just going to wrap up real quick. And the, 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 I think I've gone on a little bit, but I just wanted to say too that the way that we did this is it's not that we set up the classes. One of the things that happens in the neighborhoods that we work in is that there's often little bits and pieces. So you have Riseboro, an interfaith hospital, one Brooklyn Health offering uh, di uh, these DSMES classes, but they're having a real hard time recruiting people to go to them. And then we have like these faith-based organizations or senior centers who's like, we have all these patients with diabetes who don't know where to go, but we don't have anyone to teach these classes. And so a lot of what my work is doing is like trying to stitch those different pieces together and have like a centralized location where people can find out about the classes and then again too these consistent predictable level of classes um, and structured outreach we reach out to all all to retail outlets to senior centers to food pantries and just really go deep um, in bed -Stuy. And, and this is, so far this has been great. Before, when we started the set, we had no, there were no classes offered. And this is a little map of bed -Stuy. We We have hosted, we, there's 14 classes that we're hosting, seven are completed. I actually think three are in progress and four are, um, and, and four are scheduled. And we've had 167 people registered, which is really kind of the target because we don't want a full, um, you only want like six to eight people per class. Beyond that, it gets a little difficult. They're goal setting classes. Um, and this is due to our partnerships. Um, what Leanna mentioned is it's the women. Like this is like, you know, I was like, I run the demographics, I gotta, I gotta, I had a presentation to do and it's like 87% women. So this is also a question to you or to everyone out here is like, where are the men and how do we get them and get them engaged and okay. involved? Mm -hmm. so. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Maggie. So you, a common theme in a lot of uh, these, uh, your introductions is um, getting, first getting uh, people to attend. Uh, and I, I feel like uh, what, uh, Department of Health is doing in Brooklyn is you're leveraging the assets that exist, community assets that exist. So that you know you're working with partner organizations that are already delivering the DSME, etc. Um, and uh, I want I wanted to ask the panelists, you know, what are your experiences with with that in terms of? It seems like from Liana's perspective, they're having a lot of success recruiting, although, you know, we have to address the gender divide, but um, 
it seems like you ha you're having a lot of success recruiting, so I wanted to see, I wanted to get your take on, you know, what is it about your programming that will attract uh, these individuals to these programs? Um, given that, you know, there's a whole robust evidence base on lifestyle modification, you know, we all learn about the DSME that Maggie just spoke about. Uh, there's also the Diabetes Prevention Program, which is the gold standard um, diabetes prevention trial uh, that was uh, published in early 2000s. Uh, but still, you know, fast forward to 2024, we don't see any, we don't see DPP at least integrated into routine care. And, and why is that? So what are we doing? What are you all doing to sort of to c promote uh, participation in these um, programs? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, so I would say that the most important thing we can do is invest in relationships. Um, some of you have heard me talk about this before, but when I mention that we have this network of uh, individuals in the community from many different walks of life and we're recruiting through community organizations, the way that we do that is by spending every month of the year and sometimes every week of the year out doing things. Um, this weekend we have two different teams going out to two different events. We're here today, we've got three more next week. And at every place we go, somebody, some group, usually it's two to five people from our network, is there talking to people, sharing stories, and really, you know, preaching about how powerful this way of life is. So that when the time comes, when we have our virtual program, which may be somewhat more accessible to certain people, but inaccessible to others, um, we do have sort of an in-gathering of people then, but we, it's very intentional. Every single time we run a, run a program, I reach out to this church that we just did a program with two months ago, <coughs> or that community center that we've had a relationship with for three months, for three years, and all of, all of those pieces together feed people in. Um, I would think that it would be harder if we were just in one spot in a community um, and trying to get people in. So the, the goal is not to um, draw people to us, but to become magnetic through our relationships in the community. But that takes a lot of investment of people and resources. Uh, Dr. Duper, do you want to add to potential perhaps barriers or facilitators to um, addressing sort of the real world uh, challenges that our populations face with regard to preventing diabetes and obesity and chronic disease? Sure. So going back, I mean, this has been a long journey. As I said, it's over 25 years. So the first 10 years we spent in understanding the disease ourselves, trying to train our local physicians who, you know, needed to be trained in nutrition. And those were the barriers that people did not know that this could be a serious problem. And then going and going to the communities, going into schools, churches, health fairs, and just keeping the word out, getting the word out, like you're saying, going everywhere to make sure people are aware that this is a resource. And then you start getting your referrals, and people know this is a resource. They're, they're going to send their kids here, and then the kids get better, and then they have uh, community engagement, like we are talking about social relationships. So the barriers, uh, the main, major barrier came into that we are always treating disease, um, but we are not understanding that un unhealthy eating, sedentary activity, obesity, increased weight gain, all these are diseases. This is, the body is not regulated. And to try to explain that to a lay person, forget about a lay person, try to explain that to physicians, we don't understand that. And all of us are telling patients all the time to do this and do that, and there's no empathy. Uh, it's always the blame, it's always a patient's fault. So that, that, that takes a lot of barriers, that's the biggest barrier, because if a patient comes into your office and you're going to blame him about his weight or you're going to blame him about, so the first thing we try to teach families and patients, um, and deal with patients when new residents come in, to start with saying it's not your fault. You know, you've got the weight problem, and then explain the genetic environmental interactions, which Maggie, you know how much we did. For every <laughs> dog, we, we work together on many events, yeah. and to tell them how the epigenetics works and how the environment has become so toxic and so obesogenic, no matter your genes were there to protect you from losing weight many millions of years ago. So that's a huge barrier. People don't understand that, right? They don't understand why this is happening to them. Now those same genes in this environment are just being reprogrammed and they're redirected, they're re-expressed to s store more fat. And the, and the more fat you store, the more hungry you get. 
So most of these patients are con chronically hungry. Now, if I, I always start with the, my plate and explain to them eating the fruits and vegetables, start with at least one fruit or vegetable, because there are studies shown that if you eat your fruit before your meal, you will reduce your ghrelin level, you'll reduce your insulin level, which are the hunger hormones, you'll feel less hungry. So now that, that's a way of helping. That's a way of helping these patients understand. But if you just give them advice and not explain to them what's going on in their bodies, why it's not their fault, then, then you can engage the kids. So engaging the kids is most important because they've just come here with stigma, with weight bias, with fat, blame, shame. Everybody's been, we have a full psychological assessment and 90% of them don't want to look at your face when they're in the office. They want to look up at you. So first is just having them connect with you and then giving them these little steps, which basically don't do anything too much except engage them. They're not going to really change a pound on the scale. Or, you know, just, but over a period of time, at least engaging them is a very important aspect. And then those community events we had were very important. The resources we offer them free are very important. But sometimes free didn't help because they still didn't come. So I, we're not still sure what exactly works. Each one is different. Some people love it, some people hate it. Um, so we are still learning. But uh, last thing I'd like to add is uh, adding the anti, I know we all have been against medications today, but I must tell you that sometimes you need it. Just like an asthmatic who's severe asthmatic, you can't tell them just be out of pollen or be out of the environment. You still have to give them the nebulizers, you still have to take. So the anti-obesity medications have changed the way their appetite regulation is. They're feeling for once, they're feeling not that craving, that hunger. They're coming back losing 10, 20, 30 pounds for some of these kids. And then they're now exercising more, they're eating healthier food. So I think combination is really helpful. Uh, and if any of the panelists can answer this. Can you elaborate a little bit more based on your experience? I, I just want to also um, elevate that these, everyone here has been working in the community for many years. So it seemed like you know, there's this idea that we have to be there you know, and build trust with the community. Part of sort of establishing uh, this, uh, or promoting participation in these programming is sort of establishing trust with the community. And it seems like that is also a recurring theme. But I wanted to get a better sense of, you know, you know if you, the panelists can comment on what are the structural barriers? I know Maggie talked about it a little bit more. Can, um, can others speak about, you know, some of the structural barriers or the social determinants of health that are serving as, you know, barriers to getting better sleep or barriers to, I mean, we all um, understand it's not that easy to, you know, to buy us. It's not, it's not cheap to buy or, uh, a salad. It's cheaper to buy a Big Mac than it is to buy a salad here in New York City. And so um, do you have programming that addresses that? Or uh, can any, any of the panelists comment on, on that? Do you want, you want Maggie, to go, do you want to speak? I mean, I think the health department is looking towards that increasingly. It's, it's, so yes and no. I mean, there's, you know, there's health bucks where you get, I think it's three health, I, it's been a while since it's been in, under mine, like for every $5 you spend, you get an extra $2. Um, there's new programs, there's uh, for NYC CARES members, there's a program called Groceries to Go, where people get $100 a month to online order groceries. Uh, there's another program that the Bureau of Chronic Disease is running, where you're starting to see like if people go into certain grocery stores, and if you have SNAP benefits, you get an extra $50 or a certain amount for fruits and vegetables every month. Um, and so I think that's the direction that we're going in. I don't think we ha we're where we need to be at, on s at scale yet, I would say. Um, yeah. Other panelists? Yeah, I find that uh, the problem is about food preferences. Most of our patients, we've asked them and we've done, uh, one of the students did a social determinants of health uh, questionnaire over the summer for our family members. And I was surprised to see that more than 85% said they had access to fruits and vegetables. Uh, they did not have a problem buying them. They have them at home, they have to throw them out. They go waste. So most of the time it's a food acceptability problem for our, our families. Uh, the kids just hate eating fruits and vegetables. So um, again, um, the, 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 there is definitely, they're underprivileged. They don't, don't have the resources, which we, many of us have, so we cannot just compare. Um, they have gym-free memberships, but they don't go there. Uh, their Planet Fitness does a full free membership all summer from May to end of August, free for all teenagers to come in. I mean, that's excellent. And I mean, 20%, 30% also will not join. 
uh, Fresh Air Fund does free exercise uh, programs all summer, which is outdoor camps for two, 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 two weeks at a time. We've partnered with all these organizations over the years. We've given them free access to everything. But I think it's just adapting to that and accepting that and going with it, which is the problem we are finding. The resources are there. Um, I'll add that, yes, I, I also agree that many people in New York have more access to healthy food than they may be familiar with, and so that some of that is just an educational opportunity for us. Um, we at Plant Powered Metro New York generally are not working with people with severe food insecurity, um, so you know I don't have that experience to share with you. Um, but I do think, as I've said in, in a few different forums, that when you give people the lenses through which to see their food system differently, they start to understand, even if they can't make change. And um, I know there's been a lot of talk on, in the various panels about incremental change. Um, part of the reason why we, in the Jumpstart program, encourage people to make much more substantial change all at once is because we ha this, this may be one of the most effective ways to change our food preferences so fast. <coughs> so um, there's research, of course, on how we are uh, addicted on a biological level to our food, to foods, whether they're processed foods or animal foods. And unless we create distance between ourselves and those foods, it's very hard for us to just live in this state of limbo in between. As some, many people have talked about, you can't tell an alcoholic to just have a little bit of alcohol. And so if you just have a little bit of processed foods in your home, actually it's really tough to avoid them. Um, and so I think that part of our imperative in public health is to be a little bit more extreme with our messaging because people need more extreme measures to deal with the extreme rates of chronic disease that we have. Um, and I think there are ways to do that that are loving and culturally relevant and sensitive, um, but we have to sort of hold up a higher standard mm -hmm. and show people what's possible because when I you know, share Rotasha's amazing story, Rotasha no longer has asthmatic symptoms anymore and no longer has uh, pre-diabetes anymore. Um, people don't believe it because they haven't heard that it can be possible. Uh, but it is possible when you take more, in, more drastic measures. So I, I think that may not be a structural barrier, but it certainly is a perception barrier, a mindset issue. Yeah. And I think we need to address that as well. Great, that's a great point. And that is an excellent point. I, I don't want to take up too much time. I think I, our panel is over, but I want to give the panel just one more. If anyone have, wants to add anything regarding you know, uh, any additional educational tools or resources that you found most effective in facilitating lifestyle change, um, please do so before, I guess, uh, we take questions from the audience. Does, have we covered everything? Go ahead. Um, I think the one thing I would just say in terms of like recruiting folks is authentic community engagement. Uh, Dr. Afable talked about the um, trust with folks. And so like we don't go on the streets and flyer. When we go to like retail stores, we don't just say, hey, can we drop flyers? We engage, hey, do you know anyone with diabetes? We're worried about this. We're worried about that to bodega owners. And bodega owners are not like our primary audience. Like we want them to get help. But we found that when we actually engage folks, the other folks sitting in the store hear it, and we can see on Eventbrite that they click on it after we leave. So like our community health workers go out and they're like, what was the point of that? And I'm like, mm -hmm. I can see the point of that because I can see that 20 people have like clicked. So even though they didn't engage with you, um, that kind of engagement, when we, talk, when we try to recruit people on streets, we don't say, do you want to take our diabetes class? We say, hey, we have some questions about health in, uh, in Brooklyn, here's this, here's that, blah, 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 like 10 or 15 questions. And then at the end of it, here's a bag, but you know, would it be okay if we added you to our diabetes mailing list? And so we found that to be much more effective than kind of a direct approach uh, to um, recruiting p people. And that was true for COVID vaccination as well. Thank you. I think we have a great uh, resource, um, source of resources from the DOH, the food planner, the food plate. What I, what I think is necessary is to engage more physicians, medical students to learn this for the future, to make sure the EMRs, the electronic medical records, actually have all these resources so you can print out at point of care. Um, those are not being done. I mean, this conference is great and we don't have any medical students, we don't have any medical residents. And though I sent it to everybody in, my, in the pediatric department, <laughs> they should be attending these conferences. They should get the resources for, from a doctor's point of view. We're just two or three doctors here representing this whole field of diabetes prevention. And I think your community members are doing such a big, great, very better job than all the physicians are doing together. So I think we really need to get the physicians on board. 
Um, I'll also say just um, because we're in a healthcare setting here and an academic setting, uh, the main resource that we need to keep fueling is the awareness of our medical professionals. And I'll give you one story just as a closing from my perspective. Um, we have one of our mentors in our Jump Starts who reported back, um, on, this was on March 14th, so about you know two months ago. Uh, four, this was four months after a Jump Start that he had been involved with. And one of his mentees, one of the participants, got back in touch with him to tell him how things were going. Now this was a woman who had come and held up a huge bag of meds in their very first mentorship session. And she said, he says that she burst into tears as she was pretty much housebound. She told her doctor she was starting this program and he tried to dissuade her as he said it would mess with her treatment. <coughs> However, four months after she completed the program, she's down 40 pounds and counting off all of her diabetes meds and insulin. She lowered her blood pressure meds and she's on the, on the path to get off of it. And the only thing she says, just like what Dr. McMacken said, I wish I knew all this information sooner. Mm -hmm. We need to do better, and I think healthcare really has to be on board with all of that. So I'm grateful for all of you to be in the room and so many of you already sharing the good news with your patients. So um, can, we, can we start with the question? Yeah. Hello, hi, my name is Lynette Townsley. I'm the Youth Committee Chair for Community Board 12 in Queens. And thank Queens. you so much. This has been um, very empowering. Um, but, so I'm sorry, this is very emotional for me um, because my dad is diabetic and um, he's in an assisted living um, program. Um, at Boulevard in um, East New York, Brooklyn. And it's very hard for me. Um, he gets um, Medicaid and Medicare, but it's very hard for me to help him with a plant-based diet because he believes his doctors. And when I went to the doctor and asked them, you know, we want to do a holistic approach, they told me that you need to get a naturopathic doctor. Like, they, it's very blatant that, you know, no, we're just gonna put him on insulin and that's that. Where I'm trying to, you know, I helped him to do the plant-based, but then even in the assisted living, they have chocolate cake. And I'm wondering why we're not, although the facts show that the food that are in our communities, especially in the black communities, are addictive. Why are we not treating this like drugs? Because that's what it is. You know, when we grew up, you know, at 53, we didn't have all of these dialysis. You had one hospital, and that was because you fell or something and broke something. Not for these diseases that are, you know, it shouldn't even be. Um, so I'm just concerned why we don't treat it as a drug at, because that's what it is. In addition to, I work for United Parcel Service, so I couldn't stop working during COVID, and that's when I turned plant-based. I could not find um, healthy food choices in my community, and I live in Addisley Park in Queens, one of the most wealthiest urban communities, and my local store, the Stop and Shop, you know, when you read the codes, the three, the four, or the nine, you know, um, whether it has pesticides, but it's also not real food. They have fruit with no seeds. So it's not the same thing, and I could not, I have to go like two towns away just to get real food so that I could use food as my diet. So we have a really challenging time and we really have to call it what it is because even with my dad, it's insulin. They're not looking for anything else and we would have to, I would have to pay out of pocket just to service him or help him. Thank God he did start doing a plant-based, but then he couldn't eat where he's living. He had to come to my house. So now he's off of the insulin, and I think they have the pill, but it's still challenging because if I'm not there day to day, 
it's addictive. So he's gonna go to the food that they're giving him. So um, if there's any way that we can uh, really talk about what can we do for our communities um, to really help them with the foods that have um, become a drug. Yeah, I agree with you, and um, I didn't want to say that, but I, in my clinic, I always tell my patients that this food is addictive. There have been a number of studies which show functional MRIs when these kids are just, or humans are just exposed to some of these high-calorie, high-processed foods. Their brain cells, the areas in the brain which, which are pleasure-seeking will just light up. So these foods bring immediate pleasure, just like smoking does, just like marijuana does, just like opium does. So these are act absolutely addictive foods, and that's what we are working against. So these kids are used to having ultra-processed um, foods, which are making them sick and um, causing the disease. So as I already alluded to, that the healthcare professionals are not trained to do this. They're not thinking of it like this. So we have to work with community members. We have to educate each family that these foods are addictive. And the more they eat of this, the hungrier they'll get. So one of the commonest things that the kids, I said, come to the office, they say they're hungry, 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 hungry all the time. So uh, again, we're talking about medications. You, If you treat addictions like with, with other sort of... Uh, uh, treatments like Alcoholic Anonymous, you may have to do group sessions to de detoxify these patients, which is not really available right now. So for obesity and for diabetes, it's approved. Medications are approved. How are they working? On, on these axes. Now, nobody wants to accept that because they say long term you're going to be on these medications. But, but if you're addicted to something, you need that. Oh, but what about, so aren't cleanses or in, in some form, some lifestyle modification programs are considered you yeah, know, cleansing? Yeah, I'm sure, but they're limited and they, they, they're not, again, again, accessible to all these patients and these kids will not do, not kids, even mm -hmm. kids who are people who like ultra processed foods, they don't want to do those cleansings or, you know, they just want to keep eating, but there are alternatives, mm -hmm. but they're for the privileged people. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I don't just, think oh, that oh. they don't want to do it. They don't have access, access. Mm -hmm. because so plant-based food is delicious. Yes. We've experienced that today. They don't have access. And mm -hmm. I think even as a government, when you give SNAP, when you give, look, you have to buy healthy food, but then we also have to have healthy choices. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So I was, I'm going to just to, a couple of things with that. One of the things that's really interesting, that, and I can't find this, but the mayor's office a couple of mayors ago, or one or two, I don't know how many mayors ago, did a really fascinating study that people spend the same percentage of their money on produce, no matter what your income is. So if you're making $200,000 a year, you're buying like chopped organic pineapple and spending, I think it was like 12% of your money. And if you're making, if you're making, you know, $20,000 a year, you're spending 70% of your income on produce and you're buying like a bag full of apples that you can stretch and probably not as much. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, we did, and I'm going to get some of these data like points. Actually, yeah. Oh, sorry. But is it, everybody, just, wrap, wrap let's up? just go. One oh. more question? Or? Okay. Oh, we yeah, need fish. We, okay. okay. I just wanted to talk about food marketing that's targeted towards black and Hispanic people, and they're specifically children under two. And so it doesn't just happen that folks walk out and they pick an apple over this. There's an aggressive marketing campaign that happens. And it's been, like, food marketing has been banned in other countries to children under the age of 18. And that's a, that's a policy level decision that um, was talked about a lot several years ago. I don't know what's happened with it. There are more questions. Yeah. I, it's up to. Yeah. We'll take one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for all the work that you guys are all doing and the doctors and all these programs. Um, my question is about uh, kind of piggybacking on sustainability, and I don't know if the mayor's office is still here, um, but how to make it more sustainable. Like, if, like you go to these neighbors, there's, there aren't many, there's the bodega for the, the groceries to get healthy food. And um, my question is, is there any work on, for example, uh, like community gardens on apartment roofs or putting um, grocery stores in those sort of um, desert areas, you know, in New York and um, where there could be a grocery store where you could get healthier options. Um, so yeah, that's my question, just more community gardens, um, you know, and that would even fuel the oxygen in New York and everything, so. 
Maggie. So I can do real quick that there's a fresh food initiative which re which reduced a lot of the burdens for grocery stores to open up in neighborhoods. So they there are tax incentives. You don't need a parking lot in New York City, um, and several different things. So it has been somewhat that's been somewhat effective. The, the other thing that happens with hyper gentrification is that grocery stores open up and like the grocery store across the street from me, it's nine dollars for half a gallon of organic milk. I mean, like, come on, you know, my feet they're like, it's not that's not reasonable. And so. Um, so yeah, so yes, there's there's stuff moving for there, and there's also the Shop Healthy program that helps uh, bodegas have off, have healthier uh, food offerings as well. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. I know that this is there's a lot to talk about. We're I mean, we're just scratching the surface. Yeah. Thank you. Concluding remarks. <laughs> you made it. We've had some attrition, but it's far less than most conferences, so that's, uh, that, that's good. So um, in tying this up, it should have been said at the start, but we've had some great sponsors, because th this conference is expensive, and they're acknowledged in the program, but uh, we, we had some really generous support from the downstate medical and dental staff, and they've done that in the past. Uh, the president's office, uh, Dr. Riley has stepped up. I've always supported medical students and public health school supported students. We have the College of Medicine gave a micro grant. There's been support from the Bridge Program, Main Street Vegan Academy, Burlap and Barrel gave something, and Secure Simplicity. So uh, we appreciate that. I want to give kudos to Beth Helsner who is the most detail-oriented, incredible conference planner I've ever seen. So really just, just fabulous, all of our speakers, presenters, and the audience. Um, so what's the conclusion? I, I think we've heard the saying, you know, it, it, it takes a village to raise a child, right? It's an uh, African proverb. Well, I think we learned today that it, it takes uh, six lifestyle pillars, some peer support, you know, family support, professional support, throw in a little bit of coaching and uh, behavior change, and then you can maybe do something about diabetes. You can, with good likelihood, prevent uh, someone who's overweight or has prediabetes or gestational diabetes mellitus from going on to having full-blown diabetes, and many people you can either de-escalate or de-prescribe their medications or get them into remission. Um, and the word empowering came up a few times, and that to me is a, a key point. And that's lifestyle medicine in general. You know, it's, it's up to you. It's not your genes. It's not your heritage. It's not your culture. It's not your background. It's the choices you make. Uh, yes, genetics are important, the social determinants of health are important, but overwhelmingly in almost every study, you know, your lifestyle is the big thing. We're a healthcare center. Most studies show that if you look at overall health status, 10% of it is related to the health care you receive. 10%. That includes drugs, surgery, hospitalization. That's really depressing. It's like 50% your lifestyle, maybe 10, 20% genetics, and then the social determinants in there. So that's empowering. Uh, I think diversity was also very interesting today. The, the diversity of people who attended at the networking session. The only diversity we lack is gender diversity. And this makes me nutty. I don't know why. We all, well, every time we do a conference, we have like 95% women and 5% men. Um, there may be other genders, I don't know, but um, that seems to be the thing, whether it's at a meeting, any type of lifestyle medicine. So my prediction is 50 years from now, the world is going to be composed of about 80% women and 20% men, because all the men are going to just die off early from their bad lifestyle habits. So the women have it. So. Again, thank you all for coming, um, and we're done. Hopefully in probably two years, maybe, we'll, we'll do this again. So have a great, uh, great evening. There's a question at the end. I'm sorry, but about uh, pesticides and stuff. Pesticides. Like, is there a dip, any of the studies show with pesticides versus... 
I don't know, pesticides, schmesticides, it's late in the day, I don't know, pesticides. <laughs> uh, you know, I think um, you'll get different opinions on that. I think you, there, you can actually go online and there are certain vegetables that retain the pesticides more. Like a banana is a no-brainer because you peel it. But you know, things like strawberries, I think kale is the worst one out there, but you can find it online. But yeah, minimizing pesticides is a good idea. But you probably have more toxins in peanut butter than you do in uh, pesticides in, in general. So, all right, good night everybody. Have a great weekend.